Hey everybody, welcome to the 10% True Podcast. Quick message from me before you get stuck in. This podcast is free, so there's no advertising. I don't monetize it on YouTube. You don't have to sit through any annoying adverts, and I don't even ask for any money through Patreon. But if you could, in exchange for that, drop me a like, leave a comment, share my content, and if you're listening to the podcast version, maybe leave a review of the channel, that would be hugely appreciated. It will help me to grow my audience, which is really what I'm trying to achieve. Anyway, with that, I'll let you get back to listening. Enjoy. Pyro, super. Thanks for coming back to uh, part two of this EF111 special on 10% Truth. Good to see you again. Great to be back, see? Good to be back. And uh, just a little shout out to my home host this time, since I, I uh, am an RV uh, resident, I, I'm a little uh, transient. So today I'm recording from uh, Colonel Mayor Lippman's home, uh, uh, an inspiration to uh, many thousand ROTC and junior ROTC Air Force officers. Uh, so uh, I met him later in his life, but uh, he'd been a Vietnam O2 pilot. And, uh, and had done some electronic reconnaissance himself against a, uh, uh, out of the Republic of Korea in the 60s. Had his airplane sabotaged out from under him, uh, but came back and flew some more. So good to be here. Thanks, Barry. So, so that's Colonel Lippmann. This, is, this, is, this, this episode is dedicated to him then. So if anybody's listening in, we did have a part one. If you're listening to this and you haven't heard part one, stop listening now. Go and find part one. If you're on YouTube, I'll put a link to it in the description. And if you're on the podcast, you'll just have to go back to your podcast provider and, and find that part. But this is part two, because in part one, we talked uh, with Super and Pyro about their early careers um, and how they ended up flying the EF-111. We talked quite a bit about what the ALQ-99, uh, in fact, I don't think we ever named it, but the ALQ-99, the jamming package in the EF-111, we talked quite a bit about that. I, I still have some outstanding questions on that, but I think they'll get covered today because the plan of action is to talk a little bit about flying the airplane. So Pyro, Pyro will um, describe his experiences um, as a, a stick shaker, stick stirrer, um, stick monkey, whatever you want to call yourself. And uh, then we'll end up talking, I think, a little bit about the, the cultural aspects of the F-111 and, and how some of the relationships were managed with other platforms before then diving into the um, sort of crescendo of this um, special, which is going to be talking about the airplane's role in Operation Desert Storm 31 years ago, and in particular then Pyro and, and Super's experiences flying combat in the jet. So, with that said, Pyro, tell us, what was it like to fly? So, I, I brought along a few visual aids today. We'll see if we can uh, if we can make use of these. So, I got a little plot here. I have some line diagrams of fuel flow and some uh, other diagrams of the uh, excess power. So, uh, so, as not to go too far back in history, uh, I'll, uh, I'll establish a couple of things that I learned early on in the E model, that uh, slow is bad and fast is good. Very fast, I only ran into a couple of problems with very fast. So I'll, I'll see if I can briefly recap uh, about three or four of my learning points from flying E models. So uh, I flew the E model in, uh, in England. So I uh, got a little bit familiar with all the low fly areas in, uh, in England. Uh, in England, we were not supposed to use the afterburner, but for that F-111 E model, that was really tough. At sea level, we had pretty good thrust, but whenever you went into a 60 degree bank turn or more, you had to use the afterburner. And for any kind of a toss delivery, or uh, where you're flying along at low altitude and then you want to gain some altitude, to, to maintain your airspeed, you had to tap the burner in order to, uh, to keep whatever your delivery uh, speed up. And so we used the burner a little bit. The F model guys had the luxury of really not needing their afterburner for the most of the time that they were in upper, uh, flying around in, in Europe because of the low altitude. And that could have been a contributing factor to a F model accident at red flag because red flag is another several thousand feet higher 
And the aircraft had a, a significantly different performance at four or 5,000 feet above sea level. And so that, that was possibly one of the contributing factors to some F model guys that ran themselves out of airspeed uh, maneuvering at the red flag uh, environment, whereas back home in England, they would have been fine. Uh, so, uh, so I got real familiar with all of the low fly areas. And one of the things we really enjoyed in the E model with the train following radar was when the weather was bad, we could still get operational training missions. And one of the ways we could do that was to go to the IFR low fly up over in Scotland, in the Northwest of Scotland. It was, I think it was an adjunct to low fly 14. Uh, we could go up over Macrahanish and somewhere by Benbecula. I recognize those two names. I don't have any of the actual charts, but uh, a fast is good story. So uh, we take off this one evening. Uh, when you're doing uh, IMC, IFR, you, it, you're allowed to go or launch as a, as a single ship if necessary. Usually we try to fly as two ships, but uh, if you're flying at night, IMC, no real benefit. So we head over there, we knew it was stormy weather, about 20 minutes transit time to get to the low fly area from Upper Hayford. And we're watching the weather, at least the winds with the INS, uh, no real time weather for us to do. And as we let down over the ocean, uh, the airplane is feeling quite strange at, at our normal 450, 480 knots and confirm with the nav navigator that yes, in fact, we have 50 and 60 mile an hour crosswinds coming off of the ocean off the Irish Sea or, or whatever it's called up there. And, and uh, the airplane is just really sliding around. And I'm like, no problem. I have several hundred hours in this airplane. I know what to do. So we sweep the wind back, push the throttle forward. And we do that low level at 650 knots. And uh, we're right at 0.98 Mach. And it really settles out smooth. And I'm like, see, navigator, Wizzo. No problem, we are in the smooth riding F-111 until we pop over this one little hill and it is covered with city lights. I'm like, what happened? I thought we had our navigation good. And he's like, we are, we're right on track. Well, it wasn't the city, it was the bay. It was full of about 400 fishing boats who had all come in off the ocean because the wind was so severe and so we're smoking over top of these 400 fishing boats at 250, 300 feet, 0.98 Mach. So, so fast is good. That's, you know, that was a learning point. Fast is good. The only time I fast was a problem was one time I started an instrument approach. We had diverted coming back to upper Hayford, just wanted to get home and, and get to bed. So I started an ILS, uh, the Americans, we liked our radio gear. The Brits, usually we used talk downs. Loved, I loved the talk downs at the, at the British bases. But uh, so I start my ILS at 450 knots. And, uh, and then I flew an ILS in idle for two minutes uh, as the airplane tried to slow down for the next 14 or 15 miles. I'm like, well, I might have started that ILS just a little too fast. And, uh, and then another time that fast was a problem was flying at Inserlik. We, uh, in one of your other podcasts, your uh, interviewer talked about the, the 50 or 60 mile radius we had around Inserlik that we could use as our play area. Yeah. And uh, so one day I was, I was scheduled to fly with one of our, our foot uh, whizzos, uh, Fred Cheney. And I said, Fred, I got this great idea. Remember how infrared missiles are a problem for us in the F-111 because we're always having to tap burner in order to start our pop. I said, what if we just started the pop at 650 knots? You know, then we would have all this excess energy and we would bleed it off through the turn and dive and be on our target on speed. And Fred goes, sure, let's try it. And so, uh, so I mapped out the radius and we had all these low fly planning templates with radiuses that could accommodate, you know, for your six, 60 degree bank turn and things like that. And so I plotted out my turn, but I, there was no way to capture on the map that turning radius for the climb. And so I, I forgot about it. 
And so we get out there and I, I take my angle off from the intended target, roll out, and I had a, a visual on the ground that was a, a big dam. We were gonna attack some simulated target on the other side of the lake. So beam the dam, I start to pull and, and the nose doesn't track. And, and the F-111 has an interesting flight control system. Unlike the T-37 and the T-38, which are very pitch sensitive when you get close to, uh, well, when you get up to their max air speeds, the F-111 was very much a distance equals G. If you move the stick one inch, you get two Gs, two inches, four Gs. And so, so I'm ready to do my pop and I pull back, pull back on the stick, the appropriate mount. I get my four Gs, but I've gone so fast that the nose doesn't track. So the solution was pull harder and make that nose track. And so, so the nose starts to track, but I was the stick actuator, so I was ready for it. Fred was not. And there was a little layer of clouds. And as we, as we pop up into these clouds, Fred says, I think we need to knock it off. I, I can't see. And like, don't worry, Fred, I, I got the target in sight. It's just a little wispy layer of clouds. He goes, no, no, I can't see anything. I'm grayed out. <laughs> so I'm like, whoa, oh, that kind of knock it off. And so, yeah, so it's not very often that you experience six and seven Gs in the F-111, but about the only way to do it was to go Mach 0.95 and move the stick three inches. Then you could get six Gs. And uh, so... Those are my only two experiences where fast had a little bit of a problem. All the rest of the time, fast was much better than slow. So that's what I come to the EF-111 with is, is this experience. You know, fast is good, slow is bad. And, uh, and then to illustrate a couple of EF-111 experiences with slow is bad, um, you know, I think it's, it's probably important to, to think about wing loading. And so I got this little chart I found online. And, and I don't know if you can make it out, but here's, here's an airplane that's important to think about, the F-100. Was that one of the first afterburning jets? And then here's an airplane, the F-14. It used the same engine as us. Here's a MiG-25, and well, I need to make a little extension. This chart is the wing loading chart. Oh, and look, there's the EF-111 over there at combat weight. Uh, yeah, a wing loading of 140 pounds per square foot and, <laughs> and a thrust, you know, almost near the F-100, which was known for the saber dance. If you ever heard of the saber dance. Uh, fortunately, though, we actually had slats and flaps to help us not have the saber dance. We could actually get our landing wing loading, you know, uh, a little bit better so we could land at a normal airspeed as opposed to. I don't remember what our no flap, no slat landing speed was at 220 knots. Yeah, something? it was over 200 knots and you couldn't see anything because the nose was so high. Nose. <laughs> so, uh, so, so yeah, wing loading. So your operational wing loading, a hundred and 140 pounds uh, per square foot. And so that was one of the, one of the problems I ran into one day. I, uh, so now fast forward about four years. So again, we're just talking about handling characteristics. I've been offered the opportunity. Hey, Tom, you're a, a FCF pilot. Uh, that's a guy that would take a hangar queen and, and take it out and run the airplane through its paces to try to get every, you know, every button and knob and every aerodynamic surface to do its job and, and make sure it worked right. Uh, the typical FCF profile was to take off, uh, do a couple of things, but then take the airplane and do all the terrain following radar activities, which would burn off fuel. And then you go do a supersonic run to make sure the cowls would translate. And then after you were lightweight, you would do all the angle of attack testing to, to make sure that your stall warning system worked. Well, they, they said, well, Tom, uh, uh, this airplane is G-restricted. It's got some damaged uh, nacelle formers. So there were some cracks somewhere underneath the skin. And uh, they were going to send this airplane over to Grumman and let Grumman put it back in the anechoic chamber. But it had, been, it had been sitting in the hangar for a while. So we had to do, our procedure was to do an FCF on it. And we never took off with anything other than full fuel. So, uh, so I, I look through 
the list of things to do in the FCF and the airplane was restricted, no more than two G's. And so they said, don't, don't do anything more than a 45 degree bank turn. And, and you won't have to worry about more than two G's. I'm like, I'm like, well, I'm not sure this is the right FCF pilot, but we'll, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> and so, so I go through and I take our FCF list and I cross everything off that I can't do. I'm like, okay, it looks like we can take off, do the angle of attack test, and then burn fuel at medium altitude without doing anything. Okay, let's do that. And so I, so I, you know, everyone else is thinking Tom got the order mixed up. He should have burned fuel first and then went and got his job done. But I, that's just not the way I think, you know, I had my to-do list and I went out there and did it. And so, you know, we, we do a couple of things on takeoff and, and uh, you know, monitor how the flaps and slats retract, make sure all that works. And I'm like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's do this angle of attack check and get this over with. And, uh, and so we slow down and slow down. And uh, so we get in that 200 knot range, but we're up at 15, 18,000 feet. Air is kind of thin. Engines don't have, don't have normal takeoff thrust. So we're, we're up at this high altitude pretending that we're coming in for a no flap, no slat landing. And uh, the AOA builds up, the stall warning horn goes off or whatever and stick shaker goes. We had a mechanical stick shaker, I think. And, uh, and, and so it, it didn't buff it, just like Brad Inslee says, the, air, the airplane really never got in kind of a heavy buffet because there were no vortices to, to bang off of any other aerodynamic surfaces. Because uh, So anyways, it just goes up there. You have all this synthetic warning, all the synthetic warning works. And so I, I put the throttle back where it belongs to mill power. That's the normal recovery. Heads down, and I start checking off my list that everything worked right. And review my little list. Yep. Everything looks good. I look back outside the throttles in mill, but the airspeed is not climbing and the VVI is negative 10,000. So, and so I look around and, and sure enough, the mountains are coming up towards me. And so I figure out rap quickly that the airplane is going down and reconfirm that it's 10,000. And, uh, and then my, my EWO asked me some sort of a question like, just a minute, I'll get right back to you on that. I think I better solve this problem. And, uh, and so we had to pitch it over, unload to zero G in this airplane that's G restricted, punch it into max AB and dive it at the ground to try to build some airspeed back up. And the wings were already at 26. So I couldn't solve the problem with wing sweep. So I had to, I had to take this, formerly good airplane and dive it straight at the ground and try to get some airspeed back. So lesson number two or three, slow is bad. And, uh, and then I mentioned that at red flag, similar type thing. I got myself head down one time and, uh, and we were, we were doing a little orbit to save time or to uh, expend our time because the F-111s uh, always seem to arrive at the, at the jump off point early because everybody else was still fooling around on the tanker. We would get our fuel early, get out, get out to the feet or uh, to our jumping off line early. And so I was just going slow orbiting. And, uh, and this is sort of a, an altitude story. So I had the wings swept back to 35 or 40 degrees. And, uh, and then I started slowing down to orbit and save time. And I forgot about the wing position. And so when our push time came, once again, I pushed forward on the throttle and, and there was a little mountain in front of us. I went to climb over the mountain and the pitch changed, but the airplane kept going towards the mountain. And, uh, and then the, the Wizzo, Harry, uh, looked over at me like, Tom, I think you need to solve this problem. <laughs> so once again, you know, the wings had to come forward, max AB. And, uh, you know, we, we cleared our first mountain at a, you know, a very acceptable 200 feet just, you know, not planned, you know, that was, fortunately, we were headed into red flag. So we really didn't have time to contemplate it. And uh, like I said, I, I don't think Harry ever flew with me again. He, was, he thought I was a little inconsistent, you know, when it, when it came to red flag. So, uh, so that's uh, some illustration of, uh, you know, fast is good most of the time. 
and slow, often very bad. And, uh, and so I always flew that airplane fast. There, uh, anything below 300 knots, you just had, you had no real nose authority. Uh, I think in our, in our overhead pattern, I think we came in at 350 knots, maybe it was 300. And uh, if, if you were having a, a good day and the pattern was clear, you could do our little bit of horsing around, you know, F-111s, you know, were not air show favorites. You know, you, we could come by with three different wing sweeps, but, uh, but rapid, uh, rapid angle of it, or uh, yeah, rapid turns was not our thing. So, uh, but we would still try, you know, so in our overhead pattern, you come in at your 350 knots, roll over for your pitch. And one thing I remember that would happen on the 111 is you're looking into the turn, snatch back on the stick and the nose starts to track. But the next thing that happens is the stick would actually push forward in your hand because the stabs would go all the way and then the flight controls would catch up and actually push the stick out of your hand. After that happened, you'd get this sinking feeling like, oh, I'm getting a, I'm getting a rapid angle of attack change, but the nose isn't tracking. So the nose, you know, the airplane is doing this, but it's not flying in a circle. So you'd get this real sinking feeling. And then the next thing you'd get is a stall warning indication like, ah, I'm, I'm attempting to overperform this airplane at 300 knots. So, uh, so that was some of the, the handling characteristics of the F-111 and the EF-111. And, and we alluded to it a couple of times, the, the jamming gear, there seem to be two different numbers. In some specifications, it looks like the aircraft gained 6,000 pounds, but as I think Dave and I both remembered it as being 8,000 pounds heavier. And so that's essentially flying around with a, with a typical heavyweight bomb load all the time, you know, so that made, you know, the airplane was already kind of fast in its takeoff and landing speeds. And so with another 8,000 pounds, we were probably another 10 or 15 knots faster than the, uh, the slick model. But that was one advantage is uh, all we had were pylons out on the wings. So we flew slick all the time. So, uh, so it was, once you got it up to speed, it was pretty efficient. Uh, one other handling quality uh, that might be worth mentioning in with that 8,000 pound extra weight situation is uh, something I had learned in the E-model airplane. We used to fly our low levels, get up to the northern end of, of uh, England and Scotland and one of our favorite ranges up to the north was Rose Hardy range. And so we would go up there, drop our bombs, and then uh, it, it just felt crazy because most of the times you had 34,000 pounds when you took off, 16,000 pounds halfway through the flight. I had this flight lead take me down to like 8,000 pounds of fuel remaining. And, and we had 400 miles to, to get back to Upper Hayford. And, uh, and then he, he calls uh, Bingo and Joker and, uh, and we start flying home and we climb all the way up to like 39,000 feet and uh, pull the throttles back and we're only consuming 3,000 pounds per engine or something like that. And, and so it feels like you're flying for free. And so, uh, so I remember this like, oh man, this airplane is so efficient. You get up at 39,000 feet. Well, the EF-111, you could never get up there. Uh, with regular fuel because you had 8,000 extra pounds of weight. And uh, so, uh, so my last fast as good story uh, will be a Desert Storm one. We took an airplane that had a marginal navigation system. I think it was with John. John was kind of a, one of our tall EWOs, if I remember right. And uh, he always sounded like he was up for high adventure. So this particular day, uh, we took a marginal navigation system up to the border and it, it didn't get any better. And uh, the mission was not so critical. So, uh, so after we got our fuel off the tanker, confirmed that the nav kit was not going to get any better. And, and John says, Tom, you know, why, why did we get all this gas? I said, I'll show you. And so, <laughs> so we, so we uh, turned around and uh, punched it into about half of the AB accelerated to Mach 1.2 and, and just started climbing. And 
John's like, what are we doing? I'm like, well, I, I always wanted to get this airplane above 40,000 feet. I, I've just, you know, maybe we can see the curvature of the earth at 40,000. You know, we didn't see the curvature of the earth, but we did get up to 41 or 42,000 at Mach 1.2. And, uh, and, and, and the fuel's burning off nice. I'm really happy with the whole situation. And, and John says, Tom, we're, we're at 100 miles from the base. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He goes, we're supposed to be at 10,000 feet at 100 miles. I'm like, oh, that's right. So I'm like, not to worry. We know how to do a combat descent. So roll inverted, straight down. And as, as I'm getting pointed down, I'm remembering like, oh, these, these engines are thrust sensitive, uh, supersonic. So I just better leave it in afterburner. I, I don't want to have a engine rollback while I'm descending, you know, at Mach 1.2 towards the deck. So I leave the engines at just mill afterburner and we get to descend for about 20,000 feet. And, uh, and it, it, I don't know if, if uh, um, super, if you ever had the chance to do a high angle dive bomb, I just always loved 60 degree bank, 60 degree dives because once you stabilize nose down you're standing on the rudder pedals and it's just the strangest feeling to uh to slide forward in your seat and stand on the rudder, rudder pedals while you're headed down at the earth at on this particular day 800 miles an hour and uh and, and john's like tom you know and and so i thought he was i thought he was worried about breaking the rules and i said John, don't worry. They don't have telephones down there. And so, and so, so we pull out, level off at 10,000, slow back down to some normal. So, uh, so, so that's my little anecdotal stories of, uh, of how I remember uh, the proper way to fly an F-111. You know, avoid getting slow, except when you're in the traffic pattern. And whenever you have enough fuel, always go as fast as possible because you just really got to be aware of where you are in the world of wing loading. You know, I, there's probably another airplane out there with higher wing loading, but doesn't show up on my chart. And, uh, well, so, so. so now you guys know the, the reason why I said, I love flying with Tom, but I was a little bit worried that the host nations were going to, you know, declare us persona non grata and send us home on a bus. <laughs> uh, but uh but that's all good and, and you're actually we're looking at a ghost because uh, you can't you can't recover the f-111 from a spin uh they tried that test point once during the early developmental test and uh they also got a chance to ops check the uh, capsule ejection on that one i've seen the smoke and hole out here at edwards it, it won't recover yeah. I remember that during our RTU training, uh, there was always this conversation about what a safe airplane to fly, it, it, except there are a few of these attributes that we really need to watch out for. And to illustrate that, we have this video. And so we have this video that's, you know, from the uh, operational test or, or developmental test or something. And, and the Air Force, they set it up that the Air Force insists that every aircraft, uh, you know, be spin tested. And so add some money, put a big drag chute on the airplane, and they initiate their spin test, get it into a fully developed spin at time to recover. Nothing recovers. They deploy the chute. The chute rips off. And then I don't remember if there was silence, but uh, th then the crew's like, like, well, that, that didn't work. So uh, now it's time to use the alternate recovery. And so they sent the test subject the, or the test item down to the ground and and uh, left the capsule up in the air and so they got to test the ejection system at the at the same time so we were always always pretty aware that the airplane was unrecoverable if you uh, if you uh, leave the normal flying envelope so the best way to do that stay fast don't get slow super I wondered from a, um, a, a, a sort of Ewo's point of view then uh -huh. what's it I mean <laughs> I guess anytime you're in an aeroplane, but particularly a high performance aeroplane, you're you're obviously and you're not in control. Then there's obviously a huge amount of trust that's uh, you know it's sort of tra it's a transactional relationship in that respect, isn't it? But you know, did did you develop a sense then? And you you sort of 
were sort of jocular about um, Pyro's um, sort of hijinks and, and enthusiasm for shenanigans. But did you develop a sense then of, of which pilots you wanted to fly with and which ones you didn't? Or did you have a choice? Uh, you, you had a choice, I guess, ultimately, but that was sort of the nuclear option. Uh, I, uh, I didn't have a problem with any of the pilots. Uh, our, our pilot training um, screen is pretty fine, especially for those that are sort of blessed to go to uh, the fighter track and all of our pilots were, uh, were fighter track qualified. So they were capable of flying single seat and, uh, and I had a lot of confidence in them. Uh, every one. I, I didn't get scared very much uh, by anybody because of that, right? I, I really trusted them. And I also uh, didn't have to concentrate on the jamming system all the time, right? Uh, so I was essentially a full-time, over-the-shoulder, airspeed, altitude, and heading monitor, and, uh, and the pilots that flew with me, I think, uh, appreciated that I didn't say hardly anything. Uh, if, if I opened my mouth to say something about our vector, it was because something was seriously out of whack and it almost never happened. So uh, I, I, I liked the displays in the cockpit. I thought they were good. Uh, some people don't like the tape displays tapes for altitude, tapes for airspeed. Um, uh, and I got a sense of just sort of looking across the cockpit that if you saw tapes rapidly changing uh, in any different direction, that focused my attention pretty rapidly. So um, I, I liked it much better than round dials. Uh, we didn't have any sort of heads up display. Uh, so I, I got to sort of get a crick in my neck, looking left, almost all the time that I wasn't looking into the ALQ-99 display. Is that... Yeah. Sorry, I, made a, I like that you mentioned the tapes. I made a good friend instantly when I went to a museum that had a F-14 in it. And, uh, and I was telling my wife, who's my, my favorite uh, recipient of all my knowledge uh, when we go to an aviation museum, so I'm telling my wife, you know, this, this great tape display and this fellow's listening over my shoulder and uh, gets a big smile on his face and we have a little exchange. Uh, turned out he was a Grumman engineer who designed the linear tape display and, and the whole methodology behind it, to, you know, to, uh, to take your, your instrument scan and, and turn it into a horizontal scan. A lot of times your instrument scan was like this and it it took energy to interpret that round dial and so that was the whole idea behind those tapes was to really speed up your instrument scan it was a fantastic airplane for instrument approaches so easy to keep it on speed and uh, on pitch uh, now they took your stick away dave uh, you, you got to fly with a stick for a little while and then it disappeared so how did that make you feel on your first flight you know i I grew up wanting to be a fighter pilot. That was my ambition in life. I, I uh, was denied because of my eyesight. And after that, I, it almost went sort of the other way. I, uh, I didn't want to be bothered, you know, with rowing the boat, quite frankly. I, I was good at shooting the ducks. So uh, I... Uh, I was, I was okay after that. I, I really kind of didn't mind. And uh, so my whole Air Force career, I've not had access. Uh, the B-1 was the same, right? There's no flight control access for the, uh, the whizzos in the back of a B-1 with their tiny little window on the side of the, it was so small. We called it the day night indicator. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very spoiled in the in the 111. I just loved the fact that I I could see the world. I had as good a view as anybody, and that we were sitting sort of side by side and could uh, could relate with our fingers 
uh, with gestures as well as with uh, verbal commands. So I, I liked the way the F-111 was set up. I, I, I became enamored with it actually when I was, uh, when I was in the final stages of my college career. And that's when the Eldorado Canyon raid happened. And I, I got a little bit of an education about, F-111s and EF-111s, and that's when I decided, yeah, if I'm going to be uh, a navigator, right, a WIZO, that's the one I want because uh, it had it had all the features of of being the pilot that I wanted, and and none of the drawbacks. Uh, it was it was a perfect marriage for for my desires, and I, I love the airplane still. So we got to talk a little bit about flying qualities um, from an electronic warfare standpoint. I don't think you ever had an, an exchange with the EA-6B, but we had the EA-6B guys come into our squadron. Uh, how about from a, from a system operator handling qualities? You know, what, what do you think the comparison was, uh, you know, as far as tactical jammers? Well, I... Uh... Fred Drummond was our Navy exchange guy. Uh, his call sign was Nemo, uh, perfect Navy call sign. And, uh, and I just was impressed. Uh, I wanted to grow up to be just like him. I, I, he, his level of knowledge was what I aspired to. And if I, maybe this is a gross generalization that's unfair, uh, but the Air Force the Air Force culture is different than the Navy culture. The Navy culture is much more scientific exploration, you know, gadgets, right? They were solving longitude. Uh, they were solving all these navigation problems. They were exploring the world and doing all that stuff. And so that was that sort of great British uh, naval tradition sort of uh, translated over into the Air Force, so they were they were very much uh, more scientifically oriented. Whereas the Air Force culture is much more uh, how how much how much TNT can I put on this thing? Right, having sprung from the American Army, uh, and and I was drawn to the scientific exploration part and. And maybe that's why I stayed in developmental tests for, for that reason. I, I just like the engineering. I like the science. I like the physics. And, and Nemo was the guy who taught me a lot about sort of the, the quirks and, um, and nuances of the jamming system and how the electromagnetic energy interfered with each other, why we have the tactics that we have, why we we're broadside to the target, uh, ducting of, uh, of electromagnetic energy through the atmosphere, depending on its characteristics. All, all of that stuff was, was his contribution to my understanding. And uh, I just, uh, I love the fact that we exchanged. I, and I think later on we, we did the reverse exchange. Uh, and now I'm glad to see that uh, tactical jamming in the Air Force is actually concentrated up at Whidbey Island, which has, uh, has, <laughs> has that Navy culture for the EA 18G. Yeah, so I, I have to echo that. I was really surprised uh, later when I was in the Pentagon. I haven't talked about my, my post flying career. But uh, I ended up in the Pentagon as a technical intelligence officer for lasers and high power microwaves. And then, uh, and, uh, and then uh, later got involved in requirements and, and on the Secretary of Defense staff uh, looking at the future electronic warfare programs. And uh, it was that in that last phase there when I was interacting with the other staff on requirements, I was really amazed to find out that the Air Force was was not the keeper of knowledge on electronic warfare. It was the Navy. And then in particular, uh, um, when the Army <clears throat> is trying to deal with IEDs and, and come up with methods to jam IEDs, it was all Navy EWOs that had to plus up our US Army because they had decimated their uh, e 
their electronic warfare officer force. And, and it was Marine Corps, uh, EA 6B pilots and, and Growler guys that were writing the software for our compass call to broadcast. You know, so it was the Marines were the keepers of the knowledge on electronic warfare and they were, and the Navy as the acquisition arm, they were the ones letting all the contracts to do all this <laughs> and, and keep our knowledge up and, and come up with the next exciter. So, uh, yeah, I, I had to, I, you know, I didn't have to eat crow, but I was just uh, really surprised uh, that it, it wasn't the Air Force. You know, it had been the Navy all along as, as far as our services go that were the keeper of the knowledge. Uh, and, and the acquisition process for electronic warfare. So, uh, yeah, so interesting that your experience, you know, that Fred Drummond was, you know, he was the technical background. And, and I was always impressed with how our weapon shop worked back there, that our, our EWOs, I, you know, I, I would work eight hours a day, you know, I did a little programming for our deployment planning, but the EWOs were always back there, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, you know, cooking up, you know, cooking up the jamming list for whatever our next uh, potential engagement was. So that now, was a hard working bunch back there. Chicks dig pale guys. <laughs> <laughs> not, only, not only were we in, in the back, but there were no windows, right? And you had to go through airlocks for the tempesting. So uh, we were we were way isolated. It was like it was like going into a submarine. We had all these Tempest doors with all these electronic filters and stuff. So to, to go into work, it was like, again, like Maxwell Smart. You know, you go through about three or four doors, spin a couple of dials, so then you can finally get to work. You, you mentioned Super Desert, um, um, El Dorado Canyon. Um, so what was the story from the EF-111 point of view for that then? And I don't mean, you know, the story as in what did they do and how did they plan it and all that kind of stuff, but what was the outcome? What did you learn as a community from that mission? Were they effective? Um, was it instrumental in any, in any way in what you would then do sort of four or five years later in Iraq? Now, I, I'm not an expert. Tom, you were at Hayford at the time, prop, no, or, or you're probably too young for it too. I'm not sure. Yeah, but uh, but uh, the the little snippets I picked up from from the guys that flew that mission, there weren't very many left uh, because people move on to the staff and and other things. Uh, I I really didn't make it a study, so I, I'm not really uh, feeling very qualified to to make technical comments about exactly what their plan was. I'm, I'm assuming that they knew what the electronic order of battle was, electromagnetic order of battle was, uh, and, uh, and they attacked it as best they could given the strike packages and the targets uh, and their ingress routing. Um, but uh, Tom may be able to shed some more light on that than I can. The, um, yeah, no direct knowledge. I, I woke up the next morning and my sister-in-law called me and said, thank God you're alive. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I had been working in the command post that night when all the F-111s were launching. And my only indication was the EFs canceled all their lines. And so I was degrading the EFs for being broke and they can never get those things airborne. And little did I know all the lines had just been canceled and they were actually airborne on their way to, uh, to Libya. So I, I had to do a little bit of reading in order to kind of answer your question and, and uh, maybe three things. Uh, the first thing I, I remembered that I was always surprised that the EF-111 squadron at, at uh, Upper Hayford had a colonel in charge and they weren't assigned to our wing. They were part of our maintenance system, but they were assigned to an electronic warfare wing, you know, over on the continent. And uh, and so uh, the squadron commander was a colonel, uh, and um, and I think he was an EWO at least while I was there, which was unique. And uh, and and they figured out that they needed that because that guy had to have a seat at the table with the other colonels in order to get his point across. And so I, so I think that's probably the one lesson that, that we came away with is 
you really have to have a, a f equal seat at the table once all these bomb droppers get around the tables and talking about all the targets they're going to kinetically affect. That's our modern language, uh, you know, because we were non-kinetic effects in, in the 21st century parlance and, uh, and they were the kinetic. So once they're talking about dropping bombs, you cannot get a word in edgewise unless you got some rank on your shoulder. So, so I think that's probably the only uh, retaining lesson other than the value of electronic order of battle. Uh, you know, that, that you have to have the, you have to have the national level data so you can get true EOB. Otherwise the Intel system will wear you down because uh, headquarters level Intel uh, wants to simplify things so that it can be put on PowerPoint charts or at the time, uh, you know, gel graphics, you know, so it could be presented at a meeting. And so headquarters Intel gets really watered down to do our job. We had to have the details and they needed to come through. And so, uh, so I think those were probably the two things that were reinforced that you really have to have a, a headquarters level electronic warfare planner uh, with some authority and you, you got to have that electronic order of battle. And uh, fortunately for us in the 90s, that high detailed EOB was, was just making it. I remember when I was at the E-Model Squadron, we had this new cool computer that came in with a satellite dish and uh, they called it IMOM, Integrated Many on Many. And so we finally had the detail of, of all the terrain data. We could, we could hold that in a computer and we could get the electronic order of battle and put it in a classified computer and we could lay the two on top of each other. And so finally we had a computer that could actually draw what the, what the radar envelope was, that you didn't just have to totally avoid it by 30 or 40 miles, that there were parts of the of the radar uh, mapping that you could get underneath because there was a hill there. And so we had this cool tool called IMOM, which would draw these diagrams for us and, and allow us to, uh, you know, to plan a slightly different route uh, underneath, hopefully underneath the, the radars as opposed to completely avoiding them. And so that, uh, so in the, in, in the nineties timeframe, you know, we, we had this, you know, compared to now, not high quality computational power, but for us then, finally computers were coming of age for our mission planning. And uh, so I think that would be the lesson that was reinforced. You gotta be at the table, you have to have your high quality data and you have to be forceful in employing it because, you know, the, the bomb droppers, they wanna do their thing and they really want you to be an enabler and they don't want to modify their plan because of your your uh, insight. Uh, so uh, and, and so I think that's our planning cell worked out that way. You know later on for Desert Storm, and uh, and I don't know uh, Dave in the squadron was there any history or did they talk much about? Uh, it wasn't called Enduring Freedom. What was the Panama event? We would have had our our guys involved in the planning for that. But I, I don't know if that was like a one-off or if there were some lessons learned off of that. Yeah, uh, Operation Just Cause, I had just become uh, mission uh, sort of blessed as mission capable. Uh, and I, all, all these, he was a, I, was, I looked up to as my role models uh, suddenly went dark, right? They... They were quiet about everything. Everything that they carried around had a you know classified cover sheet on it, and and it was like, go away, kid. You bother me. Uh, I I'm not sure that that was a big electromagnetic uh, fight down there. Uh, I'm sure that there were some airport surveillance radars and and other things, but uh, the EF-111 contribution to that fight uh was probably not central uh as certainly not as central as it was to the desert storm fight which was very much uh an electromagnetic battle at least at first the uh 
and operationally, one thing that carried over from Operation Just Cause was our, our the revised way that we used air-to-air -air refueling. Uh, so again, an e-model story, we had an exercise called Ghost Rider. And uh, when you do reading on Ghost Rider, it, it sounds like it was this event. We got hit with a tasking. And in, uh, in 48 hours, we'd come up with a plan to go drop some inert bombs on uh, Newfoundland or Goose Bay or something like that. So that was a 10 hour round trip. And, uh, but I'm pretty sure that we had some planning cycles leading up to Ghost Rider. And uh, the task was to see how many tankers does it take to fly an F-111, uh, five hours, drop some bombs and, and come back all nice and quiet. And uh, the first time we tried to do it, the, the tankers uh, like didn't show up and, and, and they're like, Hey, well, they'll get there. You know, usually we have like a 30, a 30 minute window to, to hit these tanker times. And so, you know, we had to, you know, cancel that one and, and do it again. And finally, uh, they came up with the procedures where the, the tanker came over the airfield. Uh, we took off or our aircraft took off, joined the tanker. And then those airplanes stayed with that tanker for all five hours. And then the tanker refueled off of another tanker. And so, and, and so that way that that tanker very clearly was dedicated to those fighters and, and not just a gas station of convenience. It, you know, their effectiveness was dependent upon our effectiveness. And so those procedures where the tanker stayed with the fighters, that was kind of invented with Ghost Rider, implemented with El Dorado Canyon, and then that that became the standard deployment technique, I think, for fighters from there on out, because that's the way we flew over to uh, to Taif. Is uh, we took off from not Shaw, uh, Seymour Johnson. Seymour, yeah, yeah. We took off from Seymour Johnson, got our tanker, and stayed with that that particular tanker for like ten or fourteen hours, and uh, and our tanker got fuel from other people. So from electronic warfare, we might not have gained much, but, uh, but definitely that operational procedure of, of dedicating the tankers to the fighters, that certainly endured from El Dorado Canyon. <clears throat> let's talk about Red Flag then, or let's talk more about Red Flag, because you, you mentioned it last time, I think both of you. Um, and one of the things you'd said was that you couldn't jam, you couldn't run your jamming cycles, you know, because of your know, classification issues, because you couldn't transmit on certain frequencies for fear of, you know, sort of uh, ruining the uh, exercise or turning people's garage doors on or whatever. Um, but but what so what could you do? And 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 this is probably a good opportunity then to also talk about the relationship side of things. Um, you know, how did you integrate with other platforms? What was the relationship like? Yeah. I I thought Red Flag was awesome. I don't know about you, Tom, but uh, and being at Mountain Home was great because we were we as the EF 111s were uh, sort of those low density, high demand asset. We went to every single one, uh, and and the Mountain Home guys got to go uh, almost every single Red Flag or Green Flag. Um, so we, we got more cycles than the, the normal, uh, squadrons got, uh, but we had to constantly sort of make our pitch for how we were, um, an asset to the battle. And if you look at, if you look at it from the, let's say an offensive counter air kind of a mission set, EF 111s were a big pain in the neck. They were, they were just uh, in the way. And, and because they were low density, high demand, and had that high value aerial asset tag, um, those guys were dedicated to us um, like they would be in a battle to protect AWACS or protect tankers, other, other assets that were, that were theater wide impact. Right. Uh, those those guys did not like being tied down uh, to guarding a particular asset. And so it's it, sort of like that scene in Top Gun where where Maverick is on the wing and he's like, Hollywood, you look good. 
I want Viper, right? You know, they're, they're off. They're doing their thing, and they just don't want to be tied down. And that red flag, it, it is not an exaggeration to say that I was shot down at red flag more times by blue air than I was by red air. But look at it from, from their perspective. They're trying to sort good guys from bad bad guys in this giant furball with dozens and dozens of airplanes in a pretty small area. And there's this, you know, radar return that is going 90 degrees to the strike package, not squawking friendly. And, and they're just asking for it. Right. So we'd get locked up and fired on and killed, uh, by blue air pretty routinely. And that was a lesson, I think, that the, the young offensive counter air guys needed to learn. How do we integrate these havas into a, a strike package that's going up there nestled next to the, to the threats, right? Between Belted and Reveille uh, at, at the Nellis Ranges. So, so they would get debriefed pretty hard by the higher ups when they fratted us, you know, for fratricide was a pretty big no, no, as you can imagine. And they've got reamed out quite frankly in debriefs and, uh, and that particular community is not known for their brooding introspection and beating themselves up emotionally about their shortcomings, right? Their, their anger was not turned inward it, it was turned to the, the problem, right, which was those freaking EF-111s uh, are trashing my ability to rage around the AOR, you know, shooting AMRAMs at will. And, and they didn't like us, right? They, they hated us. And, and besides that, you couldn't see anything coming off of their jet. <laughs> there was no explosions. There was no force lightning coming out of my fingertips, right? There, it, it was all magic. So we, we had a hard time uh, with that. And besides the fact we had the same paint scheme, right? That air superior to great paint scheme that just got, got in their dentures, you know, uh, as an irritant, I think. And they just didn't really like us. And, from their perspective, I could, I can see how we would have been a problem, right? So I, Tom, Pyro, don't start because I know you're you're going to probably talk for a few minutes and we'll run out of time. So let me just ask a uh, super follow up yeah. question. We'll kill the sure. call, restart, and then you'll can talk, you can talk for as long as you like, mate. Okay. Um, um, and now I've forgotten what my follow up question was going to be. No, I was going. That's it. Okay. So. So well, that that makes sense, but so you said that you were uh, sort of a hindrance to them in that respect. But but I, I recall from our sort of you know from the the online sort of email chat that went around, but also mm -hmm. that your capabilities interfered with some of their capabilities as well. So you so they they had to work around those, or or they had some capabilities that were muted because of the work that you were doing. Right. Well, I mean, when we're when we are doing the job, right, electromagnetically. We could jam ourselves in in a way that we couldn't we couldn't help. Uh, and if you're an F-15C pilot, you are relying on electromagnetic means to identify good good guys and bad guys. And if if the good guys are jamming themselves, uh, they look like bad guys. Uh, so so now my sorting task is is greatly complicated because of the just the nature of the transmission of all this energy uh, and so they had to they had to check their card where are the ef-111 is going to be at this time and that time could that be them oh now i can't take this long range shot i've got to get in close to make sure that it's really a bad guy this time and because of that i lose my tactical advantage it's it's a pain, right? EF-111s go away. Uh, <laughs> I'll save myself from the SAMs, thank you very much, uh, because I'm magnificent. And, and I'm, 
I, I don't blame him, right? I think if I if if I was uh, from one of their squadrons, I probably would have thought the same thing. Yeah, the it was a challenge, and so uh, tempered with with my follow on experience at the Pentagon, uh, um, Dave alluded to it. I think in some of our conversations, and and you heard some of your other interviewers talk about red flag, and and there's a little bit of frustration because you get there, you get this briefing. They tell you how, you know, experimentation and individual leadership is the way that the Air Force moves forward. And then suddenly you're constrained. And and that constraint came in because the red flag mission was programmed a year ago and everyone had to turn in their training objectives. And and you were kind of graded on your exit from red flag as to how you met your training objectives because Tactical Air Command had to pay for this exercise. So they needed valid metrics and they needed those metrics fulfilled in order to keep the funding running. And so that's where part of the rub came in is, you know, we're at this world-class training event, but yet we find our hands tied. My Pentagon experience taught me that uh, when you have material deficiencies, if you have a shortfall in your equipment, you can either pay to fix it or you can try to train to overcome it. And the EF-111, as delivered, had some significant material deficiencies. You know, as, as Dave mentioned, his follow-on job was, was going to be to, to test that improved F-111. And I remember uh, several conversations when I was in the 111 about, well, we know we got this problem with our radar warning receiver gear, but, but we only have so many lines of memory in the system and if we want to add something new, we have to throw something out. So, 111 guys, what do you want to throw out so that we can add a new wing form uh, for you? And so we had all of these material shortfalls, and uh, and they kind of came to a head at our experience in Red Flag because uh, we didn't have two radios. We didn't have any way to pass data back and forth uh, between us. And so the Red Flag solution was, well, then we just need to train. And it was an unresolved training issue. We, we never really solved that problem of being in the air-to-air -air airspace. And the, the, uh, the leadership said, well, we'll just peel off a couple of F-15s and we'll protect those EF-111s. Well, the F-15s didn't budget for bringing two extra airplanes to, to cover the EF-111s. They only brought their squadron and and their squadron was primarily to go shoot down red air. And so the two guys that got peeled off to protect us, uh, you know, it, it was unresolved. That was not a good solution, but it was imposed on them. And it was, a, it was, it was an unsolved problem uh, that carried on into Desert Storm. Um, and there, there wasn't really a, a solution for it. And, and it didn't show up in the training objectives. And so, as, as Dave said, it was very clear that, uh, you know, they were not going to become introspective and come up with a solution because they, they couldn't train on that at home. You know, how are they going to train on high value targets at home? You, you can't get one. They're high value. They're, they're already tasked. There's no way to get one on the training schedule back home, uh, you know, to pretend. And so it, it was an unresolved issue that that carried forward into into Desert Storm. Uh, but. Me, being inventive, of course, I came up with other things to do to try to make myself valuable. So on one particular mission, uh, you know, this this problem, it persisted. And we were real short on blue air on, on this one. And it was very well known. Red air knew how many blue air there were. And blue air knew how many reds there were. So uh, they would know as, as the two forces are coming towards each other. They could, they could sort the enemy and find them all. And so on this one particular day, it was whether it was going to be a short push, I mean, like a short vulnerability time, I knew that I had excess fuel. So I talked to my wingman and said, hey, you know, I got this great idea. Let's pretend to actually be blue air. So we can, we can leave on the blue air frequency and we will push with, with the blue air at high altitude, way up in the near stratosphere at 30,000 feet, you know, near, we're hanging on the blades, you know, as, as some people would say. So we're way, way up high, 32,000 feet, push in at Mach 0.9. And, uh, and we, we came in with the other blue air 
and we were way up to the north. The blue, I think there were only f four, you know, whether they were 15s or 16s, I don't remember. And then we only went for like 30 seconds. And then, and then we did a, a hard turn simulating a drag, which is kind of a, a uh, bait. And so it's a way to try to bait the, the defenders, the red air. So we were trying to bait them by rushing in at a high speed and then and dragging back. And, uh, and we actually sucked a couple of red air our direction in the, in the debrief. They, they said, you guys were cheating and fighter pilots, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. And uh, so the red air is like, you guys were cheating. You were only supposed to have four red air and you, or you only supposed to have four defenders and you had six. And, and where'd the other two come from? And, uh, you know, but our drag maneuver came at a cost. Uh, in order to do that 4G turn to come back, we had to lose 20,000 feet. <laughs> and so, so in 111 high wing loading style, uh, not only did we do a drag, but we, uh, you know, we tactically descended, you know, down to the low altitude environment and then, and then joined the push. So, so that was one of the challenges is there was really no one willing to solve that material deficiency with an adequate training solution. You know, it was just imposed on the, on the blue air that they were going to protect us. And, uh, and my get off the stage point was, uh, you know, in addition to having call signs like grape and toast uh, assigned to us, uh, one day when I'm in the cap, I'm on the, I'm on the uh, blue air frequency and I hear, I hear this really happy voice. This guy's fired up because he says, Fox one on the big gray F4 chasing the EF 111. And, and there were no F4s in that mission. You know, these, these VID experts shot down the big gray F4, you know, chasing his wingman. And, uh, and that just, you know, stuck with me, but, you know, not to be too negative on red flag. That was, you know, again, in the 1990s, uh, we now had 15 years of experience flying in those mass packages. And there, there were all kinds of mistakes that did get solved. You know, we, we solved a lot of, lot of communication problems and tactical problems working at Red Flag. And I really felt privileged as, as an EF guy. We got to fly in every one of them. We went to Red Flag six times a year. And most units went to Red Flag as an individual once every three or four years, you know, the units were programmed two years in advance. And so, uh, so we had a lot of fun, you know, uh, we got to go often and, uh, and it was a fantastic training environment. We solved most of the problems, but that one problem of having a dedicated cap for the high value assets was a, an unsolved problem that, that persisted into desert storm. One last question then on, on the, red flag experience before we start talking then about Desert Storm and uh, your preparation for it and then deployment and, and involvement in it. One of the things that obviously that is great about um, the red flag exercise is the availability of red air assets. You, you talked about those. Your job is to jam systems on the ground. It's known, it's declassified through CIA files, you know, this have glib program of the 70s where real uh, red air threat emitters were put on the ground, and and you could float. They could they could be flown against. Uh, so super. When we talked last time, you said that kind of what your job is to look at what the radar operators are doing in response to what you're doing. Um, so was there any element then of being able to fly against real threat systems, um, or if not, was there any element where you could fly against um, synthetic systems or you know sort of made up systems? Um, and then, and then, sort of tune your response to what they were doing. So, so beyond saying, okay, we're flying in the right place, we would be running this program at this point in time if we were doing it for real. Um, and then that—that's the end of our red flag. Were you actually doing anything that involved you responding to something that you were seeing, something dynamic, something of real training value in that respect? Yeah, I, that was the best EC range in the world, uh, at least the, the best that I had ever seen. Um, very high quality threats, some of which I think are acknowledged now uh, that were no kidding, the real Soviet asset uh, or, or obtained from sort of a foreign military sales program from the Soviet Union 
to uh, uh, other countries. Uh, I, I don't think that's talking out of school. Um, we were restricted in what we could do. Um, some shackles put on us for various safety and security reasons, but we really did get a sense of, hey, this is, you know, this particular type of radar uh, and it has these characteristics and, and we learned those and they learned from us as well. The operators of those systems and the, and the whole network that connected them all um, learned some great lessons about what EF-111 jamming would do to their integration of, of those systems. And the F-4Gs would benefit from that, right? The, the uh, IADs went down, so the individual emitters would have to come up and search with target tracking radars, make them vulnerable uh, to anti-radiation missile strikes. That was awesome electronic uh, combat training, uh, the best in the world. Did, um, I think I only participated in red flag. Did uh, uh, it, There must have been a shortfall in green flags or, or something. Did you ever do a, a green flag or a night red flag, Dave? I, I did, uh, yeah, I did a number of green flags, both before the war and after. Um, and they were concentrated on uh, electronic combat electromagnetic combat <laughs> and then uh and I, I really have to thank the the ef units we uh we were all put in for top secret clearances while i was there because they were i think they were just going to get started on on flying on doing some more testing to see how best to support particular airframe types against particular radar systems and then uh, later when I was in the Pentagon in that intelligence office, we had a guy in our office that was dedicated to SA-2 spoon rest modifications. Uh, he watched all the SA-2s around the world uh, to see how they were being modified after the Desert Storm experience because there apparently a lot of people were recording that war uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, so spoon rests were always getting modified. We were, my particular office had a specific tasking of supporting a branch called AQLZ. Uh, and their symbol was a black orb uh, of the planet Earth. Uh, so they felt they embodied the black world. Uh, we were tied to them as their intel support. Uh, we had the authority to go through all the different intelligence agencies and read their files uh, to see what they'd been collecting. Our job was to see if any of our high dollar equipment had an Achilles heel that someone was exploiting. And, uh, and so that, uh, you know, I think it illustrates the point that we had a guy dedicated to the SA-2 radar spoon rest watching all the modifications to see how they were taking that long wave uh, radar and, and bringing it up to a, a 21st century uh, weapon. Uh, my particular area was electro-optics. I was supposed to see if, if we had an Achilles heel in all of our uh, infrared guided weapons and, and laser weapons. So, so we were constantly looking to see if there were any laser dazzlers out there that could try to blind our, our uh, uh, laser guided bombs. You know, fortunately, those weapons are pretty tough. It's difficult to dazzle a, a bomb because they're so small. But uh, so, so yeah, I enjoyed getting that top secret clearance. I never got to fly in any, you know, sort of operational test uh, type missions. Uh, uh, but I know they were planning on doing that, you know, trying to integrate us into these little specialized activities where they would have just two or three objects out there on the range flying against an actual weapon. So uh, um, yeah, we were, uh, you know, capturing a lot of good data on, on how to defeat those things. Those, uh, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought it up. A, a spoon rest or a bar lock or any of these, uh, radars that we routinely went after didn't stay the same over time. Uh, and, and there were some, you could just picture in your mind that they, they were in their garage, right? 
customizing their their particular gadget, making it uh, radiate uh, at a little bit different frequency, figuring that we were locked into certain certain things and couldn't couldn't see that. And so there was uh, there was some aftermarket work going on. Uh, a lot of the systems were transitioning d- during that time frame from vacuum tube analog to digital systems uh, on the ground, and that affected uh, their performance. And, and we were monitoring that. They were doing their tweaks, trying to get around us. Uh, there was a real back and forth going on between, between the jamming community and the operators on the ground. Let's talk then about preparing to go to war. When, when did you find out you were going? For me, it was at my high school reunion. Uh, <laughs> one of the one of the greatest, you know, you, you picture in your mind, you know, these fantasies of uh, you know getting even for all the slights that you suffered when you were on the chess team <laughs> at high school or whatever. And so we're in this big banquet. Hey, welcome. This is. I think it was my 10 year class reunion and, uh, and the attendant at the facility walks in and goes and has to make an announcement. Is there a Lieutenant Harris in the room? You have an urgent phone call. Uh, so p- please come and take this call. Well, Saddam Hussein had rolled into Kuwait, you know, the week before everybody was talking about it. And, uh, and as my wife and I left, you know, in my mind's eye, I'm just picturing the, the head cheerleader who married the quarterback turning in disgust, go, you know, how did I wind up with this loser, right? As I'm walking off to war in front of my whole high school class, uh, I'm sure it wasn't that way, but in my mind's eye, it was pretty awesome. The, uh, I guess my recollection was uh, I, I was a wing life support officer. So I'd, I'd been a little bit out of the mainstream of the squadron, uh, sending people to G lock training. So I was not the favorite guy in the wing because I kept sending these people to the centrifuge just so they could be proven to need more bench weight lifting. Uh, and so, uh, so I was a little worried when they're starting to put the list together. I'm like, whoa, I, I didn't make a lot of friends uh, sending people to the centrifuge. I, I, you know, I hope I make the list. And uh, apparently, once again, lucky, you know, uh, that I, I fell in that sweet spot. I wasn't valuable enough to be an instructor. I was fully qualified. So I, I met right there in the middle. So they like, Tom, we're going to have to pull you away from wing life support and send you to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. And, and uh, I don't know if they retested us on our go, no go pills or something, but we started getting our shots and uh, or no, we actually just had our shots because we'd been to uh, Bright Star, I think. So we already had our uh, overseas shots and uh, got issued a, a, a little packet of go, no pills. And, and uh, uh, my wife asked me something like, you know, is there any discussion on this? And and I was, gave her a quizzical look, like discussion on what? <laughs> and uh, and it, I think it took me about a month be replaying that conversation until I finally understood what she was asking me. You know that you know, is, do you have a choice in this? And and I was like, no, I don't have any choice at all. So so uh, yeah, what was our original contingent? Twelve airplanes or ten? Uh, on the 22nd of August, so pretty early in the tip bid flow, uh, uh, six ship of EF 111s got sent. And I was all thrilled to be uh, on the list as the snacko, right? I, somebody had to keep the candy bars and sodas in the fridge at the deployed location. So they tapped me. Uh, and I was crewed with John Rattery. Uh, we left on the 22nd. My wife was uh, two months pregnant, and uh, and I was I was a terrible husband, right? I I was so excited. <laughs> I I was so excited to go. I just couldn't believe that I was, you know, on the varsity team finally, and 
and uh, and my long suffering beautiful wife, God bless her. Uh, she she understood. Uh, at least she didn't let on that she didn't understand. Uh, and we took off uh, headed for Seymour Johnson. Uh, Rat and I got a uh, generator fail and it wouldn't reset right over Kansas about halfway. And, uh, and so we had to, to land as soon as practical, the checklist said, and the airborne spare went on to Seymour Johnson. And I was like, devastated. How could this happen to be the air, the spare is going to take my spot. It, this is awful. And so rat and I got on the ground and we unloaded the airplane, all of the travel pods, all of the flight pubs, all that stuff commandeered a couple of mobility bags from McConnell air force base supply and, uh, and hired a taxi. I think it was to take us across town to the Wichita international airport where we booked a flight to Raleigh Durham, uh, North Carolina and, and checked all these bags full of pyrotechnic flares and guns and ammunition and all kinds of stuff. And the, the gate agent was very patriotic, didn't ask us any questions. We were in our flight suits and we were, you, he could tell by our demeanor that we were not going on vacation. Uh, and, uh, and luckily that all happened. We got into crew rest in time, uh, made it into Seymour Johnson, sent the spare air crew back to, to Wichita to uh, tend to our jet. And we took theirs across the pond the next day. And that, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, if it, if it was the next day, we had to we had to work our crew rest because we knew the next day's flight was going to be like I think we ended up spending fourteen hours in the air. At, uh, and we took off at six p.m. and flew straight on all the way through. And uh, and so we so we had to manage our crew rest so that we could get up just in time. And, and take off and meet our tanker and and uh, so, so yeah that was that was a, a it was a neat deployment uh, and, uh, and and we had a whole group of people that planned that for us they were like the fly across the ocean planning team and uh, so they took care of all that planning for us and and it worked out pretty well until we were arriving uh, crossing over the Red Sea then uh, then our tanker who's who's been sort of our mission commander, uh, is relaying information that uh, we're not exactly sure which airfield you're landing at. I, I don't know if they changed it or if it was just unsure. I don't know if we knew we were landing at Taif when we took off. Uh, but uh, as we're crossing the Red Sea, as I remember it, there's this conversation on the radio and and me and the EWO are, are going between our pubs making sure, okay, we got the landing information for this base because Seab was Seab Oman was our original bed down base. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. was our wow. flag location for F-111s. But uh, unbeknownst to us, the, the cannon guys who should have been the primary F-111 host unit uh, by reading a couple of books found out that they were pushed off the table. And so Seab Oman uh, became an F-16 hive, I think. And, uh, and then we were sent to Taif, which turned out to be a fantastic deal. That was one of the premier Saudi bases. So we had, we had F-15 contractor billeting when we were off base, and we had air-conditioned, hardened shelters when we were on base. Uh, so uh, so we, as we're crossing the Red Sea, we found out exactly which base we're landing at, and, uh, and we land there. A little bit jittery. Between, uh, I think, Dick Scarborough, his wife baked us about two dozen chocolate chip cookies. And so we were living on chocolate chip cookies and uh, just a little bit of, of uh, go pills. Uh, so by the time I landed, I was just a little bit jittery. <laughs> but because of the fantastic flight control system on the F-111, you could you could pretty much fly your approach with your fingertip. So, so the jittery hand, you know, just using my fingertip planted that thing on the ground and uh and then we got over there i think we slept the first night 
unless that was Egypt, someplace we slept the first night in base ops. And then we finally got in processed and found out that we were going to stay at contractor facilities. Uh, and so we had a swimming pool and a chow line and we ended up with a turkey dinner for Thanksgiving. And it was it was pretty easy living. But uh, so we had that whole desert shield workup, which I think was invaluable uh, to our crew coordination and 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 the buildup of the command and control system was phenomenal. The, the first time we flew in country a few days later, we had to get a fuel contract in place. We had no fuel for our airplanes. We're at the premier Saudi air base, but there was no way to put fuel in our airplanes. So first they had to show up with some bags of money and, and buy, buy a few hundred thousand gallons of fuel. And then we could start flying in country. The, the first time we flew in country, there was no one to talk to on the radio. Uh, but fortunately, over the next three months, uh, you know, that that all flushed out. Maybe Triple C or somebody showed up and we had a comm plan. And uh, yeah, so a pretty uneventful deployment. And then this nice slow buildup during Desert Storm. What do you remember on that part? The deployment for me wasn't all that uneventful. I remember we took off at 6 p.m., flew up the East Coast pretty much of the U.S., following Great Circle route to Gibraltar. Uh, and, and about two and a half hours into the mission, I, I looked down at my INS, which the INS was not a navigation computer like you think of a navigation computer. It was more like a grandfather clock. Than it was an analog computer, right? So shafts and gears and cams and and the readouts were on these little drums that would spin around like an old timey cars odometer. And, uh, and I noticed this, this, my longitude was getting east faster than, you know, humanly possible. And there was no way to fix it. No radar updates. I couldn't see anything. It was just black, black North Atlantic ocean below me. And so I had no idea where we were uh, on the surface of the earth. We were riveted, you know, padlocked on the, yeah, we were padlocked on the anti-collision beacon of the KC-10s, which were dragging us across the ocean and had our wartime um, pallets of equipment, you know, spare parts and things like that on the KC-10. And those KC-10s would, um, would refuel themselves. So they, we followed the same tankers all the way across the ocean. And, uh, and, and as rat would get tired in between one of these 10 refuelings, I would steer the airplane from my seat, uh, using the magnetic variation knob on the analog INS to just ease, you know, S turn behind this, uh, this anti-collision beacon that we were, were locked on. Uh, as long as he added in altitude hold and heading hold, I could steer the airplane with the Magvar knob. And that's how we made it all the way across uh, the ocean. When we landed in Taif, uh, my INS said I was in Vietnam. <laughs> so that, that helped keep you awake. That's real handy. <laughs> So, so where you, you, you mentioned go, go pills and uh, did you have stop pills as well? Yeah, you did. So, but did, did you, so did you take it in turns to nap then if you were doing this sort of magnetic variation trick? Uh, no, uh, I, I needed no medication to nap ever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm ashamed to say there were, there were long stretches of that deployment. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the no-go pill, I think we were authorized to take it. Our, our flight surgeon did a pretty good job. He, I think he let it, let us know that these were, you know, World War II era narcotics and barbiturates that are habit forming. And so, you know, you don't want to screw yourself up with these things. So be careful. And, and uh, he only gave us a few at a time. And so, as I remember, we got to Seymour Johnson and, took our no-go pill so that we could go to sleep at 6 p.m. so that we could 
or no, I got that goofed up. You said we took off at 6 p.m. before the sun went down. And so, so we needed to readjust our body clock. Yeah, and so that's what we needed to slip sleep at dawn and then wake up right before our takeoff. Yeah. And so that was, that was kind of our, our perceived purpose of the no-go pill was to, was to roll your body clock forward, uh, you know, to try to force yourself or allow yourself to go to sleep early or out of cycle so you could wake up and, and try to be as alert as possible. We only, I don't think we had a problem with the, go or no go pills in our squadron there there were a few there was some sort of a message that came out of a few weeks into desert shield that said hey flight surgeons stop issuing the pills that's you know no one should be using these pills now because you know we should all be on our proper circadian rhythm so uh, so they they did have to clamp down on those and then later the the go pills were replaced with just caffeine pills uh they got rid of the amph amphetamines or whatever whatever there was uh, <clears throat> so so we didn't use them too much in in our unit i don't think yeah i don't remember using them much just just that first day just to get over what about then, having talked about the mission and the importance of understanding electronic order of battle, uh, what about your preparations then? Did you begin those in earnest before you left for, for Saudi or were you limited to doing that when you were in country? Oh, no, we, di we did our homework um, pretty extensively and we had, we had guys that were experts at it. I was, I was the snacko, right? So uh, the experts were un unfolding all that in their classified back rooms and figuring out exactly what was in country and what uh, what configurations of jammers to load, how many band-aids, how many band sevens on, you know, on each airplane to optimize to, to the EOB that we expected in the theater. And they did a great job uh, prepping that. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I, I reached out to Jay Santee, and I, I think Dave probably read through Jay's response. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if we, I think of us taking just our aircraft, but we must have had a maintenance pallet that had spare parts on it. So uh, did, do you, Dave, remember if the configuration of the aircraft ever changed? You know, you mentioned like three band eights. Did, did it pretty much keep the same configuration or were they optimized as the hostilities went on uh, i i think as they prepped the jets a lot of thought went into exactly what equipment we would fly on the jet over there uh, so that we could immediately turn to a mission we at the point at that point remember it's august of 1990 we were primed for the republican guard to just keep rolling right into northern saudi arabia and take those oil fields too and so uh, as soon as we got on the ground, we were we were uh, turning to support a defensive war. Right. And Desert Shield was the whole that whole five months of Desert Shield was was making sure that the Iraqis knew that if they came across the border, uh, it was not going to go well for them. Do you, do you remember them much about the uh, Iraqi electronic order of battle and what sort of capabilities did they have um I, I don't know if i'm confusing or if it's a conflation to talk about the iads is the mm -hmm. iads the same as what you were going up against or is that a particular portion of it what what, what can you describe it well the iads is a term the integrated air defense system is a term uh for the whole thing writ large so all of the early warning radars all of the connections uh, linking all of those radars, all of the GCI radars that were guiding the fighters to their targets, all of the, um, we call them battle management radars um, and acquisition radars, even the ones that were on carriage for these mobile SAMs uh, that were radar guided, uh, that was all part of our, of our interest the Iraqis had just come off of 10 years of existential conflict with neighboring Iran. They were 
they were well experienced and battle hardened. They they had been fighting for years. Uh, that's the reason why they took Kuwait because they were bankrupt from fighting Iran, and uh, and they had bought very good equipment. Uh, pretty much everything that the Soviet Union would release to foreign countries was in their arsenal. Uh, and that was supplemented by uh, a lot of French equipment too. So Mirage F1 fighters, uh, their, their battle management network called the carry system was, was bought from France. And so that was what stitched everything together so that the tracks could be passed efficiently from sensor to shooter uh, in, in their uh, command and control system. We made us uh, quite a study of that. And the French who were our coalition allies essentially sort of gave us the plans to the Death Star so that we could find out exactly where the vulnerabilities were. Uh, they were. They were not holding back. Uh, for proprietary reasons or anything, they they helped us very much know exactly how to take that system down. And so the the actual electronic order of battle, you know, we probably Dave, you probably didn't have to memorize it, but it was uh, early on, I think, established down to the eaches, as some people would say. Uh, you know, we had a list like we know that they have 5,000 of these items. We are going to find out where all 5,000 of these items are, whether it's the Kari interconnection points, you know, is that a data link or is that a telephone line? Uh, can we get into it with jamming or do we need to put a bomb on it? And so I, I think they had that EOB pretty early on and, and uh, we didn't have to memorize it at the squadron level but they definitely had to have it at <clears throat> both places. We, you know, our, our planning team and our Intel officers needed to have the details here. And the folks up at, at, uh, at CENTCOM staff, uh, they had to have the details. And uh, Jay Santee mentioned that early on, within a few weeks or a month, we had a major conflict. The, uh, the Intel officers up here were using this very generalized, somehow dumbed down electronic order of battle and and we had the details and our guys are trying to talk to the electronic warfare planners in the CENCOM staff and and they're reaching resistance and and uh, as as it was described in a little email CENCOM sent their guys down to see our EOB we had two two or more fantastic Intel officers that had been with the EFs for a couple of years, uh, Lieutenant or Captain Hilton and, uh, and and the one other guy, so that we had a 24-hour staff. We had these two guys, 12 on, 12 off, and, and they maintained this premier EOB. Centaf had to come down to us to get the real story, find out that we weren't making things up, that we really were doing a good job of it, and then they stole one of our Intel officers and took him back up to the staff. You know, because because these people just weren't getting it. They had been beat down uh, by their leadership too often, like happens to Intel. You know, Intel brings the bad news, and so they beat up the storm crow. And so so we had to take these guys that had pride and and uh, and and pride in their work, take them up to Centaf, and and so we could get the you know get the real EOB at at both levels. And. Uh, and so, Jay, yeah, Jay Santee wanted to make sure that we absolutely emphasized how key these these uh, couple of non-flyers were uh, to that whole process. Yeah, the, our EF-111 Intel was best in the theater by bar none. Uh, they were awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and I think they, hopefully, I think they stayed with Intel or I think they stayed in the Air Force and had lucrative careers either in the Air Force or outside. I, I think I saw several of our Intel officers as contractors later on operating some high-tech equipment at Red Flag and other places. What does, what does it render then as, this EOB? It's it's a long list of things. Do you have uh, some kind of 3D map that shows it? So you, people are visual learners. Uh, is, it, is it rendered in any way graphically? Uh, how is that 
you know maintained is it done through a computer what, what do you actually end up with as an end product it was probably, it was probably a grease board <laughs> well, when, when we got to taif uh and and what you said about the facilities over there those facilities were awesome uh the saudis had spared no expense uh in their aircraft shelters in fact the south korean contractors i think were still painting the taxi lines on there as we pulled in we walked in and pulled the plastic off the office furniture it was brand new it was awesome uh one of these shelters was dedicated for uh sort of wing intel and they would take tactical tactical pilotage charts and make a mosaic on a big board in in intel and that's and then with a with a, a sharpie a marker uh, they would put a symbol for each player in the electronic order of battle where um u2s or rivet joint or whoever right had had uh, identified the emitter as emitting from so we had a we had a pretty good visual representation of exactly where everything was we knew exactly how far they could shoot and uh and we used that to navigate ourselves uh, around where we could and then prepare our jamming packages and and receiver scanning uh, schemes so that we could punch holes through uh, the missile engagement zones for the strike package when it came time to do that. Yeah, so it so it ended up being kind of a, a manual process. We we had a lot of digital products that were transmitted to us, but I don't think we had the ability to manipulate those things within our computers. We only had a few Tempest computers. And, uh, and we did not have anything close to what nowadays, or, or at least 10 years ago, was called a common operational picture. We, we, could, compare, we could compare spreadsheets, you know, and, and maybe make those things right, but it was definitely still a manual tracking process. They had to read coordinates off, double check, and, and, and put the, the particular radar system on the map. Uh, you know, using a manual plotting, whether it was drawing it with a Sharpie, because at first you want to put a sticker on there, but what if the sticker falls off? You know, now you got to put the sticker back on and hopefully it's in the right place. So they, they had to be very, very particular, uh, you know, with, with two people, one guy reading the coordinates and the other guy drawing the image on the map. So I can only imagine that uh, we you know, we went through several iterations of the map during Desert Storm. During Desert Shield, it was pretty static. And it was all about getting it getting it right, getting the exact bar lock in the right place. And, and does that bar lock have software upgrade 1.2.5, you know, and, and uh, because the different ones had different transmitting characteristics that mattered to us. And, the, and I just remembered the we had the U2s also based at Taif, but I don't, I don't know if there was ever, ever any interaction between the two of us. It could be that we tapped into their satellite pipe in, in order to get our data because they would have deployed with a satellite dish to talk back and forth to Fort Meade. So it might have been good for us that they were there. We, you know, we might have tapped into some of their high bandwidth information in order to keep our EOB up to date. Yeah, I wasn't sophisticated enough. I was too worried about, you know, the supply of Snickers and Diet Coke to, <laughs> to worry about that high level stuff. But uh, but I do remember there was a canvas tent with concertina wire and uh, an armed guard standing outside of it with a big old uh, satellite dish. Uh, and that's that was the holy of holies of Intel, and I'm I'm sure the uh, the U2 guys and uh, and all of the F111s were were stationed there at Taif together. So the Lake and Eve F111Fs and the EF111s were together in a big composite wing uh, that was created just for Desert Shield and Desert Storm. What were the weaknesses then of this um, Iraqi IADS? Uh, well, there, there weren't many. It was, 
it was a pretty capable force. Like I said, very combat proven, uh, the top of the line from wherever they could get it from, uh, incorporated in there. Um, so we, we really couldn't rely on operator error and we couldn't rely on, uh, equipment obsolescence like we could in some of the other theaters, uh, around the world. These guys were very good and very experienced at what they did. Uh, it took uh, and I'll, our very best EWOs were sent to Riyadh uh, in what we called the Secret Squirrel Club, working with General Henry uh, at, to develop the war plan. And, uh, and they did a masterful job uh, using assets, uh, decoys, and things that that I didn't even realize were in the, in the takedown plan, um, to, to facilitate this. And it was, it was just like we had been taught, right? You go in and you, and you rapidly inside their decision cycle, uh, take things down to the point where it just causes the whole system to, to go into a coma. And, and that's exactly how it ended up playing out. But at, at the time during Desert Shield, we were looking at that going, dang, this is not going to be easy. And I remember Buster Glosson, General Glosson, who was in charge of the bomb droppers coming out to Taif right before the war. And they had run a, a series of war games uh, against this IADS. And he said, look, guys, I'm going to level with you. Uh, some of this does not look very good. The computers are predicting attrition rates up to 30%. And, you know, guys, after that briefing, I remember several of them just sort of staring at their wedding rings and, and writing letters home, uh, things like that. It was, it was a daunting challenge. Hey, so a little bit of a, <clears throat> to overcome that, we, we got to ran, run some uh, deceptive operations. I think that's documented in a few books uh, uh, where we, we tried to establish some habit patterns that we hoped they were learning from. Uh, and these were habit patterns that we suspected we were not actually going to use on, on, on the first few days of hostilities. So very much had this wall of bombers and, and uh, kind of a classic red flag approach uh, and so we did something different on the first night. And that was kind of the plan is, you know, we didn't have General Patton to set off to the side, but, uh, but we had this other approach because we were constantly exercising our command and control and our tanker tracks and all these things. We, ac we actually played out the first few nights of the wrong war, uh, over and over again. And, uh, and, and so that was part of the deception plan along with a lot of other, uh, you know, highly classified activities like uh, decoys and, and things like that. And so, so a little bit of a different war. We didn't go in and, and bomb every target right away. Uh, in, instead, we attacked the IADs first. And, and the only way we did that is because we had a bunch of electronic warfare analysts. And, and their IADs had both landlines and uh, radio links. And so they had redundancy built into that. So we really had to exercise quite a bit of overkill on the first evening. And, uh, and we started out, how did it start out with helicopters? So, uh, so they had helicopters shoot down the most forward elements or not shoot down, but uh, destroy the most forward elements. And, and then uh, on the first night, rereading a, a book called Every Man a Tiger, uh, you know, the, the big signal that he indicates in that book was when, when CNN went off the air, we knew that uh, we had destroyed a major data hub and, and the Kari system ran through it. So it wasn't because we wanted to take CNN off the air. It's because we wanted to disrupt their senior command and control. Uh, so if there was an Achilles heel, that was sort of it, that they needed some centralized control and we knew where it was. One of the, uh, the interesting things I thought in the actual, no kidding, first, first night of the war when we actually executed it, 
our squadron commander, Colonel Harjay, and Tom Mahoney, his EWO, I think were the first non-stealth aircraft across the border, off axis, looking like grapes and toast. Uh, and and the, the plan was for all the defensive caps in the Iraqi Air Force to just congregate, you know, all go for them. And sure enough, they, they all went, shot missiles, AWACS called drag, supersonic, and kinematically trashed a bunch of their mis- missiles and, and took them away from the main, uh, the main body, which uh, Tom and I were uh, associated with, headed to Baghdad that night. So we, we didn't get touched by any uh, AIs, uh, interceptors, uh, weren't really an issue for us that night because of that. And they got the silver star for that. So, so had you, um, up until, so, so for the, for the three months that you were deployed for, had you seen the war plan? How, uh, far in advance of night one? Cause you guys flew two missions, I think in your, in the first 24 hour period, how much time did you have to prepare for those? How, when did you see the war plan? Well, the Secret Squirrel Club would not were not at liberty to share their plan with us until just a few days, really, before the actual plan. I didn't really know what uh, my particular part was going to be until maybe two or three days out. Uh, they had all planned it all out for me. I knew exactly what my ALQ 99 setup was going to be. Uh, I tweaked that at, within our three ship and we decided exactly what our tactic and where our location would be finally. But it was, it was planned out and run and rerun uh, to great precision for, for the course of that Desert Shield time. It was very, very scripted and well-coordinated. So uh, I remember Marty Meyer, it wasn't the exact time, but I always saw the plan like this. It was always a rolled up map. I got the plan. I just can't show it. (laughs) (laughs) So we would see the plan and and Marty convinced us that it was real, but we just couldn't see it. And uh, so we we probably saw our mission specifics one one or two nights prior. And uh, and I. I don't specifically remember that. You know, I remember trying to stay in crew rest and be ready. And, uh, and, and I, uh, I remember flying the first mission, but I can't remember anything leading up to it. So we, we must have known a day or two prior what our coordinates, you know, what, what our actually our coordinates were going to be. But I don't think we knew who we were supporting until days or weeks later, or, or maybe that night when we came back and watched CNN and, uh, and things blew up with no airplanes. And then we're like, oh, okay, we know who we were supporting now. <laughs> yeah, Taif was, it was interesting because it, it was uh, the location of the Kuwaiti government in exile. And so just as the diplomatic uh, efforts came to a, to a head, I remember Secretary of State James Baker, uh, who was meeting with the Emir of Kuwait there in Taif, uh, actually came to the base uh, to thank us and let us know uh, how much he appreciated all of our effort. And that was only a couple of days before uh, the shooting really started. Were you, were you um, scared? Were you frightened? Uh, you know, I was more, I was too stupid to be scared. I, I was excited. I was, I was eager. Uh, just like when I deployed, right? My poor wife couldn't understand. And I, I've grown up a little bit since then. I, I don't remember being afraid. Um, I just remember being excited. Probably didn't, just didn't realize the gravity of the situation at my young age. I don't know about you, Tom. 
Yeah, I, um, good. So you must not have seen me either because I don't remember uh, being scared either. I was kind of excited. I think uh, there were a few days, like Dave said, or Super said, uh, you know, hey, this is getting real. And then and then things would kind of go back to a normal and then things are real again. And uh, so one of those times when I was, uh, you know, doing the fighter pilots prayer uh, was when we started practicing low altitude SAM defensive maneuvers. And I'm like, wow, some, somebody's going to let us do that. This is going to be awesome. Uh, you know, so, but if they're going to let us practice SAM defensive maneuvers, they must think there's some real risk up there because SAM defense maneuvers, uh, we destroyed a lot of airplanes uh, over the years flying as low as we could possibly go. And uh, fortunately, we, we thought ahead and we'd been flying our TFs over the desert and a few of us had almost flown into a few sand dunes. And so we knew that that our technique of, of popping up, turning off, trying to do some kind of a roller coaster, uh, putting the missile on the beam and then using the TFs to get back to low level, this was the problem. Using the TFs to get back to low level, the forward looking part of the TF wouldn't see the desert floor. Uh, there wasn't enough moisture in the ground to reflect that particular frequency. And the low altitude radar, it was at, it was looking backwards behind us. So the low altitude radar would not ring in either. So we were planning these missions where we were gonna fling the airplane at the ground at 30 degrees nose low, 25, and, uh, and then pull out on a minimum an, on an MEA, just on the, the barometric altimeter, not the radar altimeter. And sure enough, uh, we went out there and tried it and, uh, and we're diving down, diving down, nothing, nothing, nothing. And, and we pulled out based on a barometric and then the radar system started to work. And so that was probably my most apprehensive time while being excited because I loved doing it. I, I love being at low altitude with the afterburner in and seeing a big blue flame shining off the desert. Uh, that was exciting. But at the same time, if they're letting me practice this, they're a little bit worried. Uh, but mostly, uh, you know, mostly excited. Our, our mission, our first night wasn't that dangerous. We weren't at low altitude. We must've gone in at 10 or 15,000. It was probably on your on your uh, cards, uh, memos that you wrote up. But uh, yeah, we were kind of at medium altitude and, and our biggest worry was was the air to air. And so we were, we were probably monitoring AWACS frequencies uh, to try to get a, you know, as best they could translate the common picture to us. So we were probably listening to AWACS to see if anyone was targeting us. Yeah, I, I remember that too. I remember seeing an EF-111 with branches in the undercarriage from one of these uh, nighttime sand breaks. And the trees in Saudi Arabia are not very tall. So those guys were, you know, single digit feet away from the ground. Uh, and I was actually pretty relieved when I saw that uh, they had determined at the central planning that a medium altitude ingress to the first night of the war was was less risky than hitting the ground uh, or uh, having to deal with uh, AAA, which was uh, a deadly threat. So we were actually at 22,000 feet for the ingress uh, on the first night of the war all the way in. And then, and then we had the added advantage of uh of a cloud deck. So fortunately we couldn't see much of that AAA, even though it was there. It wasn't until maybe two or three days later that I ventured below the cloud deck and, and saw all that AAA firsthand. So, uh, so we had kind of a slow introduction to how much metal was actually flying up in the air. Oh, I, I remember seeing every single tracer, man. That that place went off like the 4th of July, and it seemed like every rooftop had had something going on. So big caliber AAA flashes, you know, flat. And then the, the, 
the aimed triple a with the tracers going up uh that was a riveting sight for me and I, in an EF-111, I, I could see out the front window. I didn't have just a day-night indicator. Uh, and it was uh, it was quite the sight. I, I still remember. How well did you know the operators of, of the systems you were going up against? One of the things that you hear about, particularly you know, people with very specialized missions, is that they're able to dedicate a lot of time to understanding the the enemy the man as it used to be called uh, let's say in the 80s uh, and i talked to some f15 guys who said that they were pretty sure it wasn't always shared with them but they were pretty sure they knew the names of the pilots that they were flying against um, and there were some psyops some psychological operations that went on uh, you know probably some other classified things around trying to offput the enemy but but how well did you know the people you were going up against who would be sitting behind those radar screens did you were there, were there signatures that uh, you might look for to understand if you were up against a particular operator? Was was the volume too big for, you, for that kind of detail to be realistic? Um, what, what did it look like? Uh, for, for me, well, the first night of the war was deep into Iraq, so we hadn't really had a chance to study any particular habit patterns uh, of those emitters. They were too far away for us from the border to, to really deal with. But by the end of the war, there were there were telltale signs of certain operators. You could tell who was on shift and who wasn't based on how they would react. Uh, and, and we were trying to be careful not to become training aids for them. Uh, so we would only we would only uh, do jamming missions or use our techniques uh, for short periods of time just when the strike package needed to punch through the missile enge engagement zone. And we, we tried not to just blast them away and give them a chance to work their way through uh, their various counter countermeasures. Yeah, that, um, that's probably something I didn't realize. Uh, I thought of getting on station, you know, flying my orbit, you know, for a close in jam for 15 minutes or something like that and getting off station stand on jam, we might be up, off jam, we might be up there for two hours or something. Uh, so it sounds like you were actually modifying the what was coming off the jet at the TOT. You know, I, I, was, I was focused on being in our orbit on time, and it sounds like you actually had a, a couple of different of uh, timing goals once we were on station. Right. It, yeah, it wasn't just a turn the switch on and and wait for the egress time. It was an active back and forth, uh, trying to keep in mind what, what the operator must be seeing and what the strike package was experiencing at that time and try to maximize uh, that. As, as the war progressed and the, the IADs had been taken down, a lot of the systems, a lot of the shooters had been shot by weasels uh, or blown up by uh, other strikers. Um, you, there were only a few emitters that would would even come up uh, by the end of the war, and so it we we were able to to do large area protection while F-111s were plinking tanks in Kuwait, for instance, or or. The, the big left hook uh, army uh, sweep that happened during the ground war. Uh, we were able to sort of just blanket coverage those guys, but by then the IADs wasn't nearly the IADs from the first couple of nights of the war. It, it had was been a, dismantled. And there was a separate outpost off to the west of the country, as I remember, H2, H3, Mm -hmm. H1 and must have been an H1 in there somewhere, but that was almost a little independent operating group that was over there. And, and so it was sort of a mini IADS that we would work on a couple of times. And by the third or fourth day evening, um, there was a situation where we got on station and the master rad comes on 
and it would not have been the apparently would not have been the full jamming package. It would have just been sort of the preparatory and the ground exploded. Heavy caliber triple A's coming up. There's a few missiles going off and, and it was almost like we wanted to turn the master rat off and turn it on again to watch it, to watch it happen over and over. Uh, because we knew that the strikers were still several minutes away and all of this, all this defensive munitions is sprouting up from the ground and then it starts to peter out and, and uh, it was nighttime. So you can see 30, 40, 50 miles. And then there's some explosions on the ground and we're like, there's the strikers. <laughs> and then, and then the triple a starts flying up in the air again. And, and, uh, and the strikers are gone because, you know, it was probably laser guided bombs at night. Uh, so those airplanes were already gone by the time the, ground exploded and there's more defensive munitions going in the air so they were totally out of sync uh with where they needed to be and and uh, so um so there was a little bit of that operator interplay you know between our aircraft and their defensive systems but uh, i don't think at that point we wouldn't have known the operators you know by their char characteristic behavior with their systems I could, I could surmise that they had standing orders uh, going into the war that if uh, the network that was feeding them tracks went down, they had orders to barrage, uh, just shoot steel into the air in hopes of the golden BB. So the master radiate switch ended up being sort of like the triple a on switch you you'd flip it on wait a couple of potatoes and then buh, 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 everything would go off uh as they as they went blind and that and that's how they did it and I, and I don't know if it's true but a lot of people said they weren't allowed to go to the bomb shelter until they were winchester on ammunition, and so they probably just expended everything they had and and beat feed out of there. Wow. C can you give an example of, um, you know, uh, if, if it's possible, can you give an example of what an electronic counter countermeasures technique would be? What, what what does that mean? Okay, so if I'm a if I'm a radar operator. Um, my antenna is putting out energy in a particular direction. You've seen the big reflectors. So there's a feed horn out in front of the reflector uh, that shoots to the reflector like the back of a flashlight, right? There's the bulb and then there's the, the silver parabolic reflector that, that sends the energy in one particular direction. Well, at lower, frequen or at lower frequencies, longer wavelengths, those reflectors have spillage out the outside edge. They're, they're much less precise than sort of the very short wavelengths that our eyes are used to seeing. And so they would set up these interference patterns all around the radar. And, and we EF-11s would exploit these interference patterns so that even if the radar was looking somewhere else, we could still get energy in there. So it looked like the jamming was coming from wherever they were looking when they weren't and that that would that would uh, diminish their ability to see in big sectors so they needed to suppress these side lobes they're called uh, as best they could and there were a number of counter countermeasures uh, that that would allow them to take down the side lobes they could lower their gains so that the noise floor uh, would be uh, below the threshold of their display. But all of these counter countermeasures came at a cost to them. They could, they could suppress their side lobes, but it would sacrifice performance of their main beam. They could lower their gains, but that's exactly what we wanted to get our stealth fighters through, right? All of these things cost them uh, even if they were working through our jamming to try to minimize that, it would cost them performance of their of their device, and and those effects in some cases were just as good as 
as the denial of the information completely. And, uh, they would end up denying it themselves. And some of those long range radars had multiple feed horns. And so, so you would have a beam for, for the different altitudes. And, uh, and so those beams all each need to be operating on a slightly different frequency. And so, so the radar as a whole has these multiple frequencies and, and they have a few to choose from. Uh, and if we could, if we could squeeze them a little bit, maybe we could push them into a suboptimal frequency. They would have turned their radar on, and they're like, "Oh, on this particular evening, you know, we're going to operate on these particular frequencies. Everything seems to be working fine." And then we come in and disrupt the plan. And so one of their countermeasure, counter countermeasures might be to 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 change frequencies or or to restrict some of their beams and. Uh, so uh, we would try to push them one way or another, push them into a suboptimal performance. You know, for them, it's a counter countermeasure. For us, it's that chess game, you know, tr you know, uh, yeah, trying to get them suboptimal. The, the diagrams we used to use showed how adjoining missile systems could depend on each other. And our goal was to, was to shrink their detection envelope so that now you had a gap. Uh, you know, we didn't have to destroy them, take them completely offline. We just wanted to open up those gaps or to, or to you know, so, uh, so they didn't have complete coverage. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. I think one of the things I, I can read into the, the, the email chain that, that uh, you shared with me is around working with wild weasels, taking those uh, early warning and acquisition type radars off air, so they have to turn on their targeting radars, and then you've got a good harm shot against those targeting radars. Did 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 you actively then work with the wild weasel teams to to make that happen, or were you doing your thing, and then you expected as a consequence of you doing your thing, they would have a a, a riper set of targets to to shoot at? No, we we work very closely in that planning cell at in uh, General Henry Pooba's little planning cell of secret squirrels. There was the triad, probably the best EWOs in the triad of uh, electronic combat, uh, working together for ma to maximize the effects. We didn't want to, as an EF-111, for instance, do a tactic which might make an F-4G uh, less capable of finding a target tracker. Uh, we didn't want to jam them accidentally. And we were also working with the third leg of the electronic combat triad, which is Compass Call, a C-130 that was targeting the low frequency comm links that, that, that stitched this big IADS together. And all of, uh, all of the best EWOs, like I said, got sent to Riyadh to, uh, to do the plan and to make sure that we weren't interfering with one another and that we were um, sort of maximizing the strengths of each. And I think I remember at least a couple of, of nights uh, that we were on the, on the same UHF frequency with the uh, harm shooters and, and the Brits as well. If I remember right, there were, there were two different code words uh, when they were gonna launch their missiles. So air to air guys have Fox ones and Fox twos our, our harm shooters, uh, I think they called theirs a magnum because big motor, big flame, don't confuse it with an SA-2. And so they would, uh, they would call out their magnum shots. And I think the, the Brits uh, called it shotgun because I think they had a tendency. I thought it was like one pod that shot three missiles. And I think I figured out later that they were actually shooting three or four missiles simultaneously. And, uh, and there was one evening when, when I heard the shotgun word go off, and sure enough, I saw three or four little shiny objects uh, go off into the dark. And, uh, and, and so there's the physical result of our coordination. You know, the only reason we saw that, it, you know, saw that out there in reality in the battlefield was because of all that planning that was accomplished ahead of time. And, you know, unbeknownst to us, you know, we were within just a few miles of each other. You know, we were probably at at fifteen thousand feet, and and uh, they were at uh, you know twenty or twenty five thousand feet or something like that, tossing those uh, those kinetic 
assets. That raises an interesting question that I was thinking about earlier. Um, you know, particularly uh, super super you shared your sort of combat diary and, and looking at some of those missions and, and you you drawn little maps of the the jamming tracks that you were flying and stuff. Did it feel lonely? Uh, you know, you weren't doing a lot of close in stuff. It sounded like you were doing more you know, sort of going out in front of them, laying down the jamming, doing your own thing. Did, you know, you, you don't have that mutual support of, you know, in some cases, you know, S-16s went out 40 at a time. Um, what did it feel like emotionally? Well, well for me, I, I go back to my experience that first night of the war. We hit the tanker. There was a whole slew of tankers, actually, in, in, in tanker tracks. And that was the first time I got a, the sense of how big of a thing this was. There were eagles, there were strike eagles, there were F4Gs, there were uh, F-111Fs. There were, it seemed to me, hundreds of airplanes in this big package. We all fenced in and turned north. And as we cross the border, I'm surrounded by like fireflies of red, green, and white lights all over, above me, below me, to the side, left and right. And they all blink out, blink, 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 as people do their fence checks in. And it, you know they're there, but you can't see them. And, and, and you're just by yourself. Uh, and everybody is operating on timing. Nobody's talking on the radio unnecessarily. We're all just waiting for AWACS to call bandits and, and give us information. And so the whole trip up after I took my radar fix off tanker and we fenced in with this big giant package, it was like we were by ourselves on a moonless night uh, headed to the capital city of Iraq, uh, which was lit up like Paris uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, it was a surreal experience. I, I could not see them. I had a terrible radar for keeping track of other people, um, but I knew that they were all there. And when the jamming turned on, the AAA started, I could look up and see streaks of harm shots going over the top of my head into uh, into this city. And I was like, I, how does a hayseed kid from rural Utah find himself in this situation? This has got to be, you know, a fantasy. Uh, Pyro, did you feel the same? Um. Um, I guess my mind wandered off. What do we, uh, so first night and, oh, did we feel alone? Yeah. Um, yeah. So where my mind wandered to was the altitude separation. You know, as those lights are winking out, you had to have supreme confidence in your deconfliction plan. And, uh, and that was one of the beauties of the EF-111 flying that we did back at home station is uh, at least me, once I became a two-ship flight lead, I was always practicing, you know, some kind of a challenging rejoin that would force my wingman to really trust his altitude separation. I would get our two airplanes flying at low level, separated by three or four miles so that we couldn't see each other, and then demand a rejoin based on altitude. So essentially turn the two airplanes towards each other in a way that we could hit each other. But we had 500 foot altitude separation. So don't freak out. You know, do not call a knock it off until you arrive over your designated point on time. And then you don't see me, you know, and then you can consult. Uh, but don't call a knock it off just because you don't see me. And, and it's scary. So uh, so I think, you know, that was the one thing that we practiced for was staying, you know, staying plus or minus 200 feet because we knew there would be other airplanes out there. So, uh, yeah, an, an interesting challenge. All the lights wink out. You feel like you're alone, uh, but at least you can listen to AWACS, you know, and their 
and there uh, it wasn't necessarily a calming voice because sometimes it was on half quick which was kind of broken or it was on the ky the the crypto radio which uh it, the nice thing the crypto radio had a real eerie silence uh when no one was transmitting it was really quiet there was no staticky noise so uh, so that was kind of calming you know because there was no static in your headset but uh yeah so you really you just had faith in that altitude separation and uh, that we'd practiced this before. In, in our last call, uh, Super, I think you, you, you talked about the report uh, that you'd pulled out at the library there, Edwards, um, <laughs> talking about the compressor stalls of the engine. And then Pyro, I think you said that you might have had some of those compressor stalls when the jamming came on for the, for the first time because you hadn't actually done that for real, um, put, put all that uh, jamming power out in one go. Um, but one of the things that, that's interesting about um, the uh, the email thread is that you also talk about some other things that happened in your first mission that you weren't expecting, and so that you know more more for you, Super. But can you can you talk a little bit about that first mission then, and how there was a difference between what you had trained to do and what you actually experienced, and and, and you know in, in terms of the pressurization of the cockpit or you know switchology or you know the performance of the engines those sorts of things sure yeah uh, we took off at um you know about two in the morning or so uh all obviously very excited uh but it's dark 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 uh headed to the tanker i remember and and being foggier than usual i'm like what why can't i do simple calculations for the rejoin. How come I, why am I so slow? Uh, And I'm starting to doubt myself. And then I remembered what it felt like when we were in altitude chamber training, where they essentially suck the air out of a chamber and give you an opportunity to feel like what it feels like when you're, when you're hypoxic, when you don't have enough oxygen. And so that you can recognize that if it happens to you in real life. And it, and it was happening to me. And, uh, and I, in the EF-111, had, uh, had my stick and throttles removed. So there was no throttle in the center console, no stick, because there's a keyboard there now. Instead of uh, the throttles, there's the radar tracking handle that now uh, the pilot and the EWO could share. The radar had been moved from where the AOQ-99 display was now up to the center of uh, the cockpit cluster. So the pilot could see the radar display just as well as I could. And, uh, And the consequence of that was I didn't really have my hands full all the time. We were in a capsule ejection airplane so that even if I had to pull a handle, I was in my own little ship. Um, So I I routinely flew with my mask down because there was really no reason to have it up. Uh, If I needed to say something on intercom, I now had foot switches instead of a switch on the throttle. So I'd step on the foot switch and just hold my mask up and we, I'd say something, and then as soon as we were done talking, I'd put it back down. So I'm I'm feeling woozy, and I'm turning to Tom, and he's fine. And I was like, I I don't know, something's weird going on. Can you check what the cabin altitude is? Because it feels like hypoxia symptoms. I'm thinking I'm freaking out because it's my first combat experience, and he, and. And Tom's like, eh, it's uh, 15, 16,000 feet pressure altitude in the cockpit. And it's supposed to be 8,000. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we've got a cabin pressurization problem. We better fix that. And he says, no, no, no. Remember, in the cabin, in the cabin pressure switch has you know, on and dump, but there's a middle position called combat. He says, we're going to combat. So in my pre-flight, I set this thing to combat. And this is one of those switches that still had the paint on after, you know, 25 years. Uh, Nobody ever touched that switch. 
Uh, and so he had set it to combat, which sort of split the difference between a fully pressurized 8,000 foot uh, cockpit and, and dump. So atmospheric conditions. So I'm getting hypoxic because I'm flying with my mask down. He's fine because his mask is up because his hands are full and he has to talk on the radio. And I was like, knock that, knock that stuff off. Go back to on or whatever. As soon as, as soon as he went back to on, those compressors on the engine, uh, the bleed air from the compressors fill up the cockpit to full pressure, right? So the co- cabin altitude goes from 16,000 feet to 8,000 feet in like a second. <laughs> and our heads felt like they were vices, just squ- totally squeezed down. And I was like, oh, this is uh, not an auspicious opening gambit for this, uh, for this combat mission. But that, that just sort of exposes you to some of the, des- the consequences of design changes that you think would be completely benign, right? Uh, we're going to take the stick and throttle out of the right seat of the EF-111 and everything should be fine. We'll give them a foot switch instead. Uh, but as a result, I flew around with my mask down and uh, almost passed out from hypoxia going into <laughs> Desert Storm and got my head squeezed in the bargain and so did Tom. So I think, uh, so my experience, fortunately, you know, I've, I've led on that uh, that I I made mistakes every once in a while flying, and so for me this was this was just another one of those mistakes. No big deal. <laughs> Flip that baby over to to uh, standard pressurization and and move on. Let's go get some compressor stalls. That's next on the list. <laughs> you know, so so uh, I'd had you know, fortunately, I jockeyed the throttles around before, and I'd had a few rollbacks. Uh, I think I had a rollback while I was on the boom one time refueling, which that's kind of annoying because you, you got to punch the other engine into afterburner. And, and uh, as I mentioned, the, you know, with our high wing loading, uh, when we're in that close in jam, those, the sharp corners, I think they were 45, maybe they were 60 degree bank turns. And so a 60 degree bank turn, that's a 2G turn. That was about the limit of our performance. And if, if anything went wrong, if you weren't getting the thrust you needed, you had to keep your airspeed because you had to have your airspeed to stay on time. Your wingman was expecting, and so uh, so any kind of little engine burbles, uh, you know, while you're making those tight turns caused a problem. So uh, so I had a couple of engine rollbacks and uh, punched the other engine into AB, then full AB, and and off and on we were going through the clouds, and so we've seen these missiles fly around AAA. And then there's fireballs in the clouds and I had to go like, no, no, this is, this is a mistake I've made before. You know, that's, that's just me messing with the engines. Uh, no, no need to get concerned. I'll, I'll try not to do that again until five minutes from now, then I'll do that again. <laughs> you, you had some other surprises on that first mission, didn't you? Was it your first or your second mission? You, uh... um, yeah, so yeah. we had, Go ahead, Tom. We got, yeah, we got we got short on fuel one time. Uh, we only had one or two EF-111s that had to land at alternate bases and then come back. So I think second or third mission, uh, we got a little short on fuel, and we had to go uh, searching out a tanker. And uh, we ended up refueling off of a Saudi tanker uh, at reasons, you know, somewhat of a high altitude. And so I'm stuck seeing a tiny little tanker 10,000 feet above us and I have very little fuel to begin with. And so am I gonna spend that fuel to go get up to the tanker or am I gonna spend that fuel to go divert? I'm like, well, if I'm higher, I can always glide farther, you know, on one engine or something. Uh, So that was, you know, sort of a, a surprise when there's so many tankers in the air for there not to be one for me when I really, really need it. You know, that was, that was, a little bit of a pucker. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, well, for, I sort of remember all the happy things. I only remember a few of my mistakes. Well, uh, you're probably blocking out this particular surprise. <laughs> I, I tried to. We showed up at, at our close in jamming orbit, three, two, one, master radiate on, all the AAA starts up, but my display looks great. All my 
anticipated emitters are showing up where I expected them to. There's a jamming rectangle on top of them. I'm, I've got a pretty good uh, electronic combat uh, plan cooking. And then an SA2 fan song shows up outside the expected container. And uh, after uh, a few radials are cut, I'm realizing that that thing is close. It's not far away, it is close. And uh, sure enough, the other EWOs are seeing the same thing. And it didn't take long before we started seeing flashes on the ground. And, uh, and six missiles ended up coming up through the taco orbit, uh, one of which fused on our number three. We were number two of three and, uh, and exploded. Uh, but we were sort of in and out of clouds and it was hard to tell but the electronic signals were consistent. And so we dodged that whole battery, expended all of its missiles, uh, and we stayed on, on station. Uh, number one and number three got the Distinguished Flying Cross for that. For some reason, Tom and I did not get it, probably because we didn't get scared enough to deserve it. Uh, at least that's what I consoled myself by saying. Uh, but after the mission, uh, I'm breathlessly headed to Intel to report this new SA2 battery. And I go to point on this big map that I was telling you about, the TPC on the wall. I said, and it's right here. And under my finger, there's a brand new two. And I'm like, you, you saw this? Uh and where did this come from? Because it wasn't in any of our planning. And he said, he kind of looks down and he goes, super. This, this, is the, this is the frustration of big Intel versus the local guys. The local guys knew the two was there the whole time. But it had been reported by a sensitive source and method that big Intel was protecting. They didn't want us going into combat knowing that we had information in our heads that could reveal their sensitive source and methods. So they just didn't tell us. So as soon as it radiated the first night of the war and, and regular e-link collectors could collect it, then they could post it up on the board. So by the time we got back, it was already up there having been collected by other emitters, but, but the sensitive nature of how they gathered the information made it such that they couldn't give us vital information. Uh, so, so there's a circular logic, right? You, you don't want to, you don't want to give damaging intelligence to air crews that could be shot down, captured and tortured. But on the other hand, if you don't give them that information, they're more likely to be captured, shot down, and tortured, right? So, so how do you fix that problem? I don't think we, we've fixed it yet. It's still a problem. Did you have any um, sort of suspicion as to, as to what those sources and methods were? I mean, do you, do you, care, oh, about, do you care about that kind of stuff? Well, you, you care about the things that you can change. And, you know, as Marcus Aurelius would say in his Stoic philosophy, you know, if it's out of your control, don't bother. Mm -hmm. But, man, I was mad. And I, I let my intel guy, who was awesome, know uh, that I was not pleased with that decision. And he's like, I, I'm following orders. I can't, I can't tell you everything I know, even if it's vital for the execution of your mission. Yeah, the, the sources could have been a variety of things. You know, it might have been a particular on-orbit asset. It probably wasn't rivet joint because that was no secret. Or it could have been some ground asset. I, I'm sure we were inserting, uh, inserting ground forces 
you know, different ways. But uh, yeah, there's, there's really, you could, any speculation you could come up with, I suppose it's possible. But uh, yeah, whether it was an on-orbit asset that we didn't want to reveal or a, a ground asset that was out there snooping and pooping, you know, I'm not sure. Can we talk a little bit about the loss, the EF-111 loss? Uh, is it, it, I mean, firstly, the impact on, on the squadron and, and you as individuals, and then maybe to understand what, what happened or what, what you think happened. The, so, so I have, happen to have that conversation with uh, Rick Graham uh, recently. So I was really excited about this overall uh, podcast. It caused me to get in connection with uh, several people I hadn't talked to in 31 <laughs> years. And uh, so uh, Rick Graham... Uh, had a little insight on that at the squadron level. And so uh, so I think I would start out with that, back to that red flag thing. This was a known problem. We had a material deficiency. You know, we did not have an all-seeing radar warning receiver. And we had an interference problem with our own uh, electronic identification system. And, and we have a very capable <clears throat> high-value asset protection in the F-15C, uh, but they they want to have their fangs out. You know, they want all of the good guys organized and all the unorganized people are potential targets. And so this, this training problem was that, you know, we could not identify ourselves as a, uh, as a friendly asset because our IFF would, would become intermittent and we would disappear uh, to the point that in some of the after action reports of, of like the, uh, the F-111, EF-111 that claimed a, uh, a kill, no one believed there was an EF-111 there because they all had the God's eye view. They knew what was out there and there was no EF-111 anywhere around there because it didn't show up on their electronic stuff. Uh, so as a result, uh, we had been up there for three or four months already. We we had experienced that red flag that we would get shot down and we could identify when we were, we were being looked at by our own friendly assets based on our raw gear. And so when we're starting our orbit and, uh, and, and we uh, fence in and put on a little bit of jamming, we know that our IFF is going to disappear within minutes. Our own F-15 cap is going to take a close look at us and try to figure out who we are. Well, we could not get a friendly wing form on their radar because we would have needed reprogramming in our in our raw gear. I can't remember the right nomenclature. Is that the ALR-62? Yep, ALR-62. So the ALR-62, we had to make a choice. You can either see an F-15C as a wing form three or you can give something up and we can and we can reprogram it so it shows up as a friendly. And uh, so we had we had been seeing this as experienced crews for for months now and and three or four or five missions already. The crew that was involved in in that uh, incident, they had come into theater later on. We kept plussing up. We kept plussing up all of our capabilities. We asked when, when we had so many missions, we requested more people. We got some folks from the 42nd. Then we got a deposit, a new deposit of uh, EFs from Mountain Home. And uh, Ratchet 7-5 happened to be one of those new guys. Um, Rick Graham said inside the squadron, there was a little bit of a conversation like, hey, what do we, what do, we do with the new guys? We don't have time to spin them up on, on all of this local knowledge that we've gained over the past four months. His recommendation was to like crossload those guys, put put the new EWOs with an experience with an in theater pilot, put the new pilots with an in theater WIZO, and and there's this challenge. They they didn't the way he related it, our squadron didn't want to uh, didn't want to break that crew integrity. They they felt crew integrity was more important, and and just us telling them that you know this might happen. As you cross the border, you might get locked up, spiked by your by your own cap. You know, you know, be careful. Uh, so that was inside the squadron. Outside the squadron, uh, we tried to 
elevate this problem. We, we tried to say, hey, you guys, stop spiking us. You know, if you, if you want to spike us to identify us as a friendly, that's fine, but don't use us for radar training. You know, don't keep us locked up for 30 seconds or a minute because it's very unnerving and, it's, and we have to honor that. If, if we don't know exactly who you are, we have to honor it and retrograde. So please stop spiking us because you're making us treat you like an enemy. And uh, so that, that was sort of, in my mind, what set the stage for the situation. You know, the, the, uh, we got the people we wanted, but they didn't have a chance to spin up on all of our local procedures, which included ignoring your radar warning receiver because there were no bad guys. Uh, AWACS didn't tell us there were any bad guys. So just pucker up and and wait, you know, and assume that it's probably your own high value uh, cap that's, that's spiking you. And uh, so to me, that was sort of the beginning of the incident and, and then uh, actually impacting the ground. Um, that was familiarity with the airframe. Uh, I've had, I had a chance to make those mistakes and do slice backs and not have them work out so well. Uh, this was a, a newer air crew. And so you can tell a person that you will dramatically lose a lot of altitude, but until you actually do it, it it's just eye-watering to lose 15,000 feet uh, in max afterburner. It, it just doesn't seem possible. So, so that'd be sort of my take on that that long-term issue of trying to overcome a material problem with a training solution. Uh, you know, that, that's a, uh, yeah, diff difficult to prove that you, you've gone the right way. So re remember the issues we had back at red flag and green flag with our own blue air locking us up. So that's, that's in our heads. Then the first night of the war, uh, there's an F-15 cap that's out of position for another uh, EF-111 that's, uh, that's escorting a package into central and western Iraq and a, and a no kidding real Iraqi Mirage F-1 spikes them and the F-15s aren't in a position to, to clean them up the only defense that the EF-111 has is um, get down on TF and get out of there as fast as you can. While they're in the process of doing that, the, the Mirage F-1 uh, trying to get a better lookup angle ends up hitting the ground because the EF-111 is at 200 feet in a hard turn. Uh, and that's the ground kill. So in our squadron mind, there's this sense of if you if you're going to save yourself from AIs, you're on your own a little bit. You're going to have to rescue yourself. And the EF-111 remember had pretty good electromagnetic SA, so we could actually see, uh, say, a Mirage F-1 change radar modes on the ALQ-99. The EWO would. A, a good EWO or an experienced EWO would be able to see the engagement happening on his screen. Uh, a new EWO may, may not be so much. Uh, we had a new pilot from Mountain Home and, uh, and an experienced actually EWO from Upper Hayford that got crewed halfway through the war. They, they didn't know the context as well, but they did know that the mindset was you're kind of on your own to save yourself from AIs, the OCA is out there uh, running down people trying to flee to Iran. Uh, that's the mindset, whether it's valid or not is a question. So, so we've got a new crew, new to the theater, coming off the tanker, fat on gas, very heavy. They get spiked. It may have been you know, a friendly Mirage F1, I don't know. Uh, they get spiked and they have to honor that. So they're, they're doing an emergency combat descent and a bug out. Uh, the radar doesn't lock onto this sandy uh, terrain and they actually bottom out 
uh, and skip off the ground that was very close. Uh, they almost made it, but they skipped off the ground. And when they skipped, it cracked the rocket engine of the crew capsule. And when they actually did lose control and pulled the, the uh, capsule ejection, the rocket motor uh, broke through the casing and it was not good. That happened on the 13th of February, right? So we're almost a month into the war. By then the AI threat is pretty much gone and we all knew it, but maybe they didn't as well. And I just remember my wife, who's now eight months pregnant, eight and a half months pregnant, consoling our backyard neighbor at Mountain Home Air Force Base, who's a newlywed bride to Doug, the pilot, on Valentine's Day, that she would never see her husband again. That's hard. So am I, am I understanding this right then, that it was probably an eagle rather than a mirage? Uh, we don't know. No. I don't think anyone will ever know what, what happened I, in their jet and what was going through their mind. So we, yeah, the, so as not to get your podcast bombarded, uh, you know, e each community has to, you know, do some introspection. And uh, as we've uh, insinuated earlier, that community is less likely to do introspection. And, uh, you know, so the Eagle community. So, you know, we will not know. But the, the, the probabilities are that, in my mind, you know, that, that it was the F-15 trying to identify who's chasing our EF-111s. Because they could, most likely, they could see all three ducks in a row and the guy in the back starts doing crazy maneuvers. And so I'm going to watch him. And as, you know, as long as you're watching them closely, you're in high PRF mode. And our radar warning receiver tells you you got a missile launch because that's, that's the mode that happens uh, just because it, it had the electronics to differentiate between these things, but we didn't have the software space. You know, we could, they would not put, a software program in there uh, to do the differentiation, even though the hardware could have done it. Uh, so they're, they're stuck. That crew is stuck. And kind of as, as Dave said, it uh, um, they got very close to, to doing it correctly. And they, you know, they, they could have been down at low altitude. The threat could have gone away. They would have climbed back and continued on their mission. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, they, you know, two or 300 feet lower than, than reality allowed. So it, it, yeah, I, I think, uh, the feeling I came away with. So when I got back to the squadron uh, you know, maybe this is the most relevant, you know, rather than the technical was the emotional. When I got back to the squadron and found out that we lost one of our crews, I was just like, we're, you know, we've been doing this for 20 some days how, you know, this, this couldn't, this could have been avoided, you know, what, what went wrong. And so, uh, so I think it was that sharing of the knowledge. We just didn't realize how much we had learned and we're fighter pilots. You know, you should be able to show up in theater and absorb all knowledge within two days and you're, you're full up with the rest of us. And I, I think that was the, the human factor was just how much we had learned and, and didn't realize how important it was to, to pass that on, you know? So these guys are on their first or second mission in theater. They probably had a little couple of local checkout flights and then suddenly they're fencing in and, and in combat. Uh, so, so that was kind of my emotional responses. I, I know this could have, could have been avoided. Uh, you know, what, what happened? Uh, Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.